Hello, hello. For being here, I'm excited to share with you this evening. Um, welcome. Uh, we've got a few different platforms uh, going here. So uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, is there such a thing as missed right? Probably because of you have you have commented on videos that I've done or um, things that I've written where you've said, I don't really believe there's a thing as Mr. Right. Like that sound, that kind of doesn't sound right to me. So um, welcome to Jennifer, Ina, Sandra, Isabel. Yeah, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so I just wanted to crack into that a little bit and then I'll open the floor and see if you've got any questions and comments, um, either about things to do with the relationship or about anything that is um, just kind of up for you at the moment in these um, powerful uh, times that we find ourselves in, um, social change, coronavirus, and everything that's going on. So uh, welcome if you've just joined us or if you're watching this after the event. So when I talk about Mr. Right, the main distinction that I'm actually making is I'm trying to distinguish uh, investing time in a guy that clearly isn't Mr. Right, right? So irrespective of whether you or I believe there is one person that is right for us or there's infinite people that could be right of us, when I'm using that expression, what I'm mostly doing is distinguishing there is probably such a thing that you and I can agree on as Mr. Wrong, right? A guy that doesn't meet the showing up standard, doesn't make it clear that he wants the job, isn't investing consistently in the relationship, um, isn't having clarifying conversations with you, isn't progressing and initiating um, in the connection. So when I talk about Mr. Right, what I mean really is not that, right? I don't necessarily mean that we know it's definitively gonna work out. I don't necessarily know that it's definitively gonna be the person that you're gonna be in relationship with uh, for a long time. Um, what I do know is that it might be someone that you've actually got a chance to work things with, right? That there's lots of things to figure out, even in a good and great relationship, right? There's lots of challenges that we have. So I'm talking about let's actually have two of us up to bat and that we want to play together, right? We're still going to have plenty of work to do. We're still going to have plenty of things to figure out. But it's very hard to play ball with a guy that doesn't want to play ball, right? Or if I'm just going to mix my metaphors here for a moment. It's very hard, you know, one of the things that I play, I can geek out a little bit is chess, right? If you're not willing to come on the board and play with me, it's really difficult for me to play with you, right? It's really difficult for me to uh, make a game happen, right? Because it's like, it takes two people. We can have all sorts of commentary about this wonderful chess game, but if there's not two players on the board, then it's really hard to make that happen and make that some kind of reality, right? So, that's what I'm talking about mostly when I'm talking about Mr. Right in the initial sense is someone that actually you and he both want to show up and progress the relationship. And that, you know, I talk about the showing up standard, right? The showing up standard has something to do with consistency. And when I say consistency, I don't just mean, you know, he sent you a lot of texts in the first week that you knew him. Um, I mean that you've gone together in real time. I know that's been harder recently, but whether that's real time on a Zoom call or phone call or whatever it is, that there is a consistency to that desire to get together, spend time together and, um, actually be in relationship, right? Actually be in relationship. Um, so I'm going to say a few Fatima, Victoria, and thank you for joining, joining us, Kimberly, um, Ilona, and um, thank you. If you've got any um, questions, feel free to bring them in and I'll start moving in that direction. You're also welcome to let me know um, where you're from or where you're tuning in. Um, wave to a few of you that have joined us from Instagram. Thanks for doing that. Got Sandra in beautiful Canada. Jennifer, hi. Hi, Laura, Isabel, Sandra, welcome. So yeah, I'll be taking some questions and comments here. Hey, Faith, thank you for joining us. Um, I also wanted to make you just aware of something. If you haven't taken the opportunity to do this, I'm just going to post a link here that will show for you guys on um, YouTube and Instagram. Um, sorry, YouTube and Facebook. Um, but you can go to becoming the one forward slash checklist, becoming the one dot us forward slash checklist. That's my free um, is he your guy checklist. And it's super, super simple, but it's nine powerful points. If you run a guy through it, the chances are you're going to get some clarity as to whether he's a guy that's worth your precious time, heart, and energy investment. Um, becoming the one dot us forward slash 
checklist. All right, I've got a question here um, from Fatima. Do you have a rough idea of how long it takes to find Mr. Right? I actually don't in the sense that uh, I think there are bigger uh, pieces at play here. So um, I don't think you and I get to decide the timeline of who comes into our life, right? You and I get to decide, our, we have our discernment, right? Who is this person to me? Do I wanna be in a connection and relationship with this person? Much more manifestations and relaxing and trusting the process and not having to force anyone into being Mr. Right, even if that takes months and years longer than you would like it to, it's kind of a little bit more of you'll know when you'll know, right? And any time that that's not true, then uh, you're likely to be kind of kind of forcing it, kind of kind of trying to control the process. Now, a big part of trust is trusting trusting the process, right? It's also trusting the timing, trusting the season of life that we're in, and the season of life that we're in is. I'm looking for partnership. The more that I'm oriented to that, the more that I'm clear and I invest things on partnership, right? So you might have heard me make this distinction between lovership, companionship, and partnership. And if you've had the experience of trying to make a partnership from something that is actually a companionship, right? A guy that wants connection but isn't going to be available for something more meaningful. Or even you might have been in a time in your life where you're actually like, yeah, I don't want anything where I have a mutual Mutual investment, deepening obligation, right? That's the sort of flavor, signature essence of, of partnership. Um, your job is just to keep noticing, and, and actually it's more of a saying no, I think, right? Being open to the possibilities, being open to the people around you, saying hello, smiling, um, being willing to receive attention, right? Noticing if you have any blocks to connecting with guys. Um, but then beyond that, who knows? It's something to do with... Uh, two people having a mutual readiness and a mutual kind of, you know, soul, soul orientation that they want to um, play together. It happens a lot quicker because I've had people talk about this. You know, if you want to have a three course meal, right, you, you don't want to just fill up on starters. So sometimes what we do when we fill up on starters is we know that there's a guy that we're giving a lot of attention to and we actually know that he's not right for us. And maybe what's controlling us is the fear that, Kind of scarcity thinking, right? If I let this go, I don't know what else is going to be around the corner. So that's where I would go with that question. Um, hey to Vivian, hey to Yvette, Celine, joining us. Um, I appreciate your reflection, Celine. Um, just throw that up on the screen quickly. Hi, Jack, I really appreciate your great relationship advice. Um, so I've got another thing here. Someone says, just found out a guy I met on a dating app is married. Yeah, so that is not actually... Um, completely uncommon, um, unfortunately. And uh, I have a video actually on YouTube. Um, it's actually one I shot with Clayton Olson, my teaching partner called Help, I'm in Love with a Married Man. You, you may want to watch that if it's come to that stage. Um, but, you know, I think as you find that out, get clear that that's not what you want to invest in because you know what you want. And if someone is like that and they meet you and they actually – there's a true connection between you and it's so important to them that they are actually going to finish their relationship or end with their girlfriend or their wife or whatever the situation is. If it's, if it's that serious to them, you can let them do that and then, you know, honor what's there and what needs to be finished. And then if there's another season, don't recommend to play, um, play, keep, sorry, keep the screen in here, keep, uh, playing that you know, long term when it's not actually getting you closer to what you want. So sorry you've had that experience. I know it's a bit more common than you and I probably wish. So Sarah has a question here. She says he pushed away saying that he didn't get enough back from his calls and text messages. Is that normal? Um, I actually haven't had someone ask me that before. So anecdotally, I'm going to say that that is uh, perhaps not super common. Right. What it sounds like is that maybe you guys are in communication style rhythm and that uh, you know his his desire to hear back didn't maybe meet your desire. Um, so uh, you know what I would like is for that to be brought to the table. Like let's talk about that. If there's actually a connection that we want to pursue, right? It's not uncommon that we're gonna have some difference in our communication styles, right? Sometimes people are more responsive in person, sometimes people are more responsive over text. Um, but if he's really your guy, I think that's something that he would want to sit down and figure out with you. Um, and if that's really enough that he's already kind of made for the hills, then that may actually be good for you. 
Um, so I love my twins has a question. Here. How does no contact done to me fit into this? Right. So I think what you're saying is you are on the receiving end of a guy going no contact with you. And I am quite a fan of pure no contact, right? By which I mean it's a lot easier to do no contact when uh, we're not trying to have half messages or, oh, you did call me, so I did take your call. So if someone has gone no contact with you, um, ideally they might have let you know that or they might have clarified what their intentions are, right? Because there's a, there's a kind of no contact which is I'm clear I want to end a relationship. And in service of that, I want to have a period of no contact so we can actually do some healing, grieving, and start to move on, right? There's also a no contact, which is I haven't been, this is from a guy's perspective, I haven't been clean and clear in my energy towards you. And if I haven't been clean and clear in my energy towards you, you no know, contact could actually be a process of reflection and deeper metabolization, metabolism, so that I know what I'm actually going to show up with. And I might come out of that and get clarity that I don't want to pursue this, or you might come out of this with clarity that you don't want to pursue this. Um, but that's actually what we're up to, right? No contact in service of clarity rather than no contact in service of ending. So I'm curious what's going on in that situation. I would use it as an opportunity to really focus on your own clarity in your own life, right? Like no contact can be hard, right? It can be almost like a, you know, going cold turkey. You can have withdrawal symptoms. I would focus on substitute behaviors. When you notice a desire that you would normally want to reach out to him, call a girlfriend, go to the gym, go for a walk around the park, sit in a different room of your house, like move the energy, do something so that you're not just kind of um, stewing in, in missing him or in trying to break no contact because I think it's actually better to honor a period of no contact more fully. All right. Thank you for that question. Hey, to those of you that have just joined us or if you're watching this after the event, I appreciate your being here. Um, if you haven't checked it out, I want to invite you to download my free checklist. It's called the He's Your Guy Checklist. And... Uh, I'll just post the link here. Um, and for those of you on Instagram, it's becoming the one.us forward slash checklist. I will add it to the bio after we've finished here tonight. Hey to Renee from North Carolina. Hey to Cecilia from Ottawa. Um, hey to Asia. I think you're in London. No contact is mixed emotions for about three weeks, but you'll get stronger. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, other question How does the man show his feelings, even if he didn't say the word, I love you? And he is saying he has an affectionate feeling. Well, I think people show their feelings in different ways, right? I mean, simplistically speaking, you probably come across this Gary Chapman's work on love languages, right? That pauses it out into at least five possibilities that the way that we tend to show our love, you know, can be through our words of appreciation. It can be through our deeds. It can be through our desire to spend quality time. Um, it can be through gifts, right? It can be through physical touch. Right, so that's sort of like a minimum way of thinking about how people show their affection. Here's a useful question to ask someone is how was affection shown, if at all, in your upbringing? Because right? that tends to have a lot of shaping of, you know, if you grew up in a culture where no one ever said I love you, right, that's probably not going to be the first words that trip off your tongue, right? Unless you've really made a decision, I didn't like that in my childhood, and I'm going to do something different. So um the other question in there could be, hey, what's important to you in how you experience affection? Is, is there some kind of request that you actually want to make more explicit? Like, hey, it's really meaningful to me when you put your arm around me. Or it's really meaningful to me when we have a date you know, that I know within the next week or two we're going to spend quality time together. Um, and the other part of this is that there's, it's very easy to uh, subjectify, right? It's very easy to want to love on other people in the way that you want to be loved on. And I'm not making it wrong. It just might not have the, as big an impact is in their world. Right? So you kind of want to find out basically what their love language is and start to practice it because it may not be uh, the most obvious thing. Um, TJ Martin says, I've never heard I love you, but I'm very affectionate. Yeah, awesome. Um, all right, I've got a question here. Duh, 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 duh. Proving my scrolling skills here. Hey, thanks so much for you. I know I didn't advertise this. I really appreciate that there's so many of you here joining us live. It's really cool. And I know we've got a very uh, global tribe here tonight. So I appreciate you being here. Um, all right. Sal Gray has a more kind of corona-related question, I think. Four months ago, I came out of a traumatic relationship. My new man and I connected. He saw my trauma relationship. How may I still share my feelings without it being a burden and responsibility on my new man? So... I like this question. And the first thing I want to say about this is if you 
if you don't orient to someone else in the perspective of my feelings are a burden, I think that might be 50% of the win here, right? Because if, if my feelings are your burden, it seems like we're in some kind of codependent connection, right? Because I'm actually not responsible for your feelings and you're not responsible for my feelings, right? You may impact my feelings. I may have requests to make to you that might shift my feelings, but we, if we're not mutually responsible for each other's feelings, we get a little bit more space to play. So I don't know if this is true, but I would posit, is it true for you that you often feel responsible for someone else's feelings? Um, the other thing is to make sure there's not some kind of implicit request or, you know, or kind of covert manipulation in here, right? If I tell you that I love you and actually what I want to hear is I love you back. And if I don't, suddenly I kind of get a bit dysregulated or I kind of spin out or I kind of shift the mood, then maybe that's where it's going to be a bit harder for, for a guy, right? If a guy really struggles to hear that you have feelings for him, uh, I'm curious if he's likely to end up being your guy, right? Because if he's, if he's at least in the ballpark of possibility of being your guy, I don't think that's going to be too hard for him to hear necessarily, as long as there's not like he has to reciprocate back in that moment, right? You're not holding um, that kind of frame. Uh, you know, I, I've sometimes had reflections that this is a slightly bizarre way of speaking, but I'm just going to put it out there in case it's useful for you. One, one thing you can say instead of I, I love you is I feel a lot of love right now, or like I'm having the experience of a lot of love, or there is love here right now. It's almost, it just, it can sometimes just depersonalize it just a touch because you might have had that experience where you're kind of welling over in the moment with love. And maybe the next moment you're actually, you know, a little bit resentful or you're a bit crotchety or whatever, right? That we all have this kind of shift in our emotional experience. So sometimes just to acknowledge, particularly if it's really early in a connection, you can just say how hey, I'm feeling really loving right now or like my heart's bursting. And that might just take a little bit of the pressure off if it's like a, I love you and, and that's something that's been um, difficult for whatever reason to hear in the connection. So thank you for the question. Amy says, knowing the love languages of all relationships in life makes those relationships easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Harmony just tuned in. Welcome to you. Um, Cecilia says, great book and app by Gary. That's cool. I don't know the app. Thank you for saying that. Um, Linda says, I like your informative videos. I appreciate that. All right. I think Vivian might have a question here. So if a connection with a guy that I dated a couple of times seems to die down and he no longer messages as much or pursues, would it be a good idea to end future conversation by wishing him good luck or just let the message connection to die down by itself? So I'm a fan of sort of doing the thing over the specifics of exactly how it gets done, right? So in a different context, if you are embarking upon a period of no contact, right? There may be some slightly more nuanced ways of communicating that. But the biggest thing from what I've seen in my coaching is that you actually do it because you can, you know, lose a lot of time, waste a lot of energy, kind of spin around in your head or kind of half do it. And then it's not clear, did we actually go no contact? Um, so I'm a, I'm a fan of things being um, explicit. And so if you want to say, hey, I've enjoyed connecting with you. This is no longer something I'm going to pursue romantically. I don't think you lose too much by saying that, right? We're, we're coming down on the side of authenticity. You're sharing what's true for you. Um, the, the challenge if you just let it sort of, quote, die down by itself is that oftentimes, and you've probably had this experience, these guys can loop back with you, right? And we never really declared something. And so now he's like, he's hitting you up randomly one night, or maybe he's kind of giving you a booty call and you don't really know where you guys stand, right? Whereas if you've made a clear communication, like I'm not really interested in something romantic here, I'm gonna downshift the connection, I'm kind of moving my attention elsewhere. You know, I tend to think that clarity is power and authenticity is queen. So that would be my orientation to that. Um, but in the whole scheme of things, if there's a guy like this, just remember, he's probably a cameo in your play, right? Which means that in the big scheme of time unfolding, this guy, you won't probably even remember him. You may not even remember his name, you know? So not saying that to be down on him, just there's lots of things that we can get worried. You know, do I do it right? Do I do it perfect? Is it the best way? Is it the exact way? But ultimately, if this isn't your guy, that's really all you need to know. And however you decide to move on, do it with as much grace, compassion, and skillfulness as you can. And I think moving on is the most important thing. Aisha says it gives him a chance to step it up if that's what he wants by saying that. Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to downshift contact and he's really clear that's actually not what I want, then yeah, let let him uh, bring that to you. Liz says, do you think it's okay to date more than one person or focus your energy on one guy at a time? I do think it's okay to date more than one person. 
I don't think it's a great idea if one of those people is someone that you really sense could be your guy or someone that you're actually really into. Uh, I think for the moment of time that that person is available, I would, I would really focus on it. Um, it's also about knowing who you are. Some people find it much easier to date multiple people. Other people sort of feel a bit inauthentic. If you really feel inauthentic doing it, it can be a good practice for you because sometimes that inauthenticity is rooted in a prematurity of connection being a relationship, right? You meet someone and then within a week, you sort of treat them like they're your boyfriend, right? You kind of prematurely get into a relationship. That's sometimes where just having a few other connections, even if they're not fully romantic connections, um, that, that can kind of keep you a little bit more balanced. Um, I don't recommend doing it as a kind of, uh, I'm sort of like playing you or like this is me and my power. Um, I don't think there's a good, it's a good to do it from a manipulation perspective. But if a guy hasn't really made it clear that he wants something a little bit more consistent and exclusive with you, then what having more than one person that you might be interested in, it stops you over imagining what you have, right? So this can also be a strategy of sobriety. So I'm most interested in what's your path of development. If it's I need to be a little bit more sober and I don't necessarily want to have this habit of getting more prematurely into relationship, I think it could be a good thing to practice. If you know that you are perhaps more on the avoidance side and you tend to de-escalate intimacy and when you actually have feelings for a real person, you tend to shut them down and, and then pretend it's casual and then go kind of see or make out with someone else, then I would encourage you not to date multiple people, right? So do the thing that actually supports your journey of development. All right, let's see if I've, uh, by the way, I won't be able to get to all the questions here. I thank you for, for bringing them. If there's something that's really burning for you and I don't get to it, you're always welcome to post it afterwards beneath the video. Um, I will do my best, but I just, I just wanna thank you for all the uh, engagement and your presence and saying hello here this evening. All right, Cecilia says, is it a bad thing to express you're still in love with the next, but trying to move on to someone new that is interested? So I think what you mean is um, you would be expressing that to this new person. I'm, I'm curious if I'm understanding that right. Um, anytime that you, you know, because if you were doing this to your ex, anytime you're doing that, I would only be doing that if you are genuinely, you genuinely think in your highest self-interest and the highest interest of both of you is pursuing a relationship. If actually it's just like, oh, I want to let you know I have feelings, but it's not good for you or I to be in a relationship, I would share that with your friend, your sibling, your mom, whoever, but I wouldn't necessarily share it with them because it's, it's kind of an invitation to reopen a connection. I don't think it necessarily needs to be um, expressed in that way. Now, if you're trying to date someone new and you're still in love with someone else, I think that's a bit of a tricky place. I admire the honesty and authenticity. Um, I also wonder if it might be good to say, hey, I'm not actually available to be in any kind of meaningful relationship right now because I've still got some grieving to do. What, what this sounds to me like if you're still in love with the next is that you want to get some support and you know, maybe some professional support, maybe some women's group support, um, maybe a coach or therapist, maybe you need to do some kind of grief or ritual process. Maybe you've done that and you need to do more. Maybe you need to be with your authentic experience and just notice those feelings and stop attaching the story of, you know, I don't know, woe betide me or I missed it or he was the one or whatever. You know, the guy was really the one. He should know that as well. All right, so if he's been fine with the downshift of the relationship, then that is also meaningful um, information. All righty, thank you for the question. Thanks so much for all of you who've joined here. Thanks for the thumbs up and the waves. Um, if you're watching this right now on Facebook or YouTube, give the video a like. That will help us just get the word out here. And if you have not subscribed to my channel, uh, come subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Um, I will just put the link here for you bit.ly forward slash Jack Butler subscribe. Join us. I release at least two new videos every week on relationships and personal growth. And it's a really cool community. And I don't think I'm, I'm probably biased, right? I'm allowed to be biased, but you know that I'm also quite good at objectivity and objectively speaking, this is a pretty cool community. All right, question here from Kangaroo Kids. Do men want a permanent compatible relationship like women? Is feeling at home the most important thing to them? You know, I think men vary. So I don't know if we can just necessarily talk about all men. I do think there are some men for whom their highest priority or at least their co-highest priority is their work and their mission and their purpose in the world. And often that can be quite attractive, right? A, a guy that you know is really committed to bringing his fullest into this life and into the community. Um, so when people say, I want my relationship to be a priority, I think what they may mean is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the number one priority, but it's a high priority, right? That it's kind of like, you know, work and you, work you and health, work you health and our family, something like that. Um, 
And I think people vary, right? And there might be, you know, I, I don't know if I've got the data on this, you know, sort of the intuition is there sometimes maybe a little bit of asymmetry, right? It may be that you care about connection and relationship and tending to that a little bit more than he does. Um, and maybe that's also fine, right? Or maybe the things that he pays attention to in relationship are um, slightly different to you. What I would say is this, season is important. Right, so you want a guy who's at a season or stage of his masculine development where it makes sense to him that he wants to be in a permanent compatible relationship, right? At many stages of masculine development, men don't want that. They either wanna figure themselves out, they wanna know who they are, they wanna have fun, they wanna be carefree, but there are stages where men actually want this and so much easier to partner with a guy who's always already in this awareness than it is to try and persuade a guy um, that he wants to be in a relationship. This is what I call impersonal to you impersonally to you, does this guy want to be in a relationship? If he is, then we ask the next question, personally to you, does he want to be in a relationship with you? And if it's a yes to both those things, then you're in a pretty good um, situation to proceed. Uh, Amy Jean says, any advice for long distance dating? Yeah, I do have a video of that on YouTube about long distance relationship. I'd watch it if you haven't. And I'm a fan of people closing that gap as meaningfully as they can if they both are interested to invest in it. So my general orientation to this is even if we end up investing, we find out, okay, it's not our thing. I actually think that's an okay investment, right? I would sort of, you know, in business speak, I'd say, yeah, sometimes you invest a bit to know, do I actually want to invest in this business? And you will be out of pocket. If you're going to buy a house, you do some inspections, you're going to be out of pocket. But that's fine because it's part of the process. And I think relationships important enough that if you spend a little bit of energy and it doesn't immediately work out with someone, great. At least you you tried, at least you um, you found out. What I think is hard is doing long distance relationship over a long period of time and then finding out that one or both of you isn't really that committed. I think that's really tricky. So I think you want to avoid that. I think you want to get up to the plate, so to speak, as early as possible and realize that long distance relationship is just a bit harder than being in the same place for, for nearly all of us, right? So I think the bar is higher. Like we actually have to be more conscious, more early of wanting to invest um, a little bit more. And um, yeah, in some ways it's like risk and reward, right? There's gonna be a little bit more risk on the front end, but if it's really your person, then it can be worth it. And you can also have some great experiences even if it doesn't work out. So I would say go for it. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Let's have a look. I'm just flicking here to see what uh, questions. Sal says, thank you, Jack, that makes perfect sense. Really, I just wish to share my feelings with a listening ear. I don't have any requests from him. I don't feel responsible for his, I support him. Awesome. Sounds like we're on the same page there. Um, all right, Kate says, I was seeing this guy for a month and a half, but because I'm a single parent, I find it hard to date. I cannot go out all the time, but I like him in order for him to spend time at my place. Got it, yep, I know that can be really difficult when you're juggling the parent thing on your own. Just, um, uh, I, but I like him in order for him to spend time at my place, he should meet my kid. And when I mentioned that, he stopped communicating. Got it. Yeah, so I don't think that's uncommon, right? That there are guys for whom actually wanting to become part of your family is not what they want. And I just think that that's, you know, it can be heartbreaking for you to know that, but just so much better to find that out, right? Particularly for kids and particularly, you know, for the consistency needs of children. I think it's much better that you find out there's someone who's like, that's a pro, I want it, I wanna be with you, and I love that you've already got a family, rather than that you are kind of fighting uphill with that. So sorry if that hurt, but I'm glad that you you might have kind of dodged a bullet, so to speak. Um, Joanna says, love your stuff. Curious what area your training is from. So um, the biggest influences on me, I think, have been Understanding the Enneagram, right? I did a lot of training in the Enneagram and I use it a lot. Um, I did some uh, coach training both with uh, New Ventures West Integral Coaching and CTI Coach Coaches Training Institute. Um, and I've also been part of this, this kind of community called Diamond Heart, which is a particular sort of inner work path um, that had quite a profound impact on me. And then I also think I've been lucky to work with a lot of people at this stage, right? I've got my 10,000 hours in coaching. And so I've learned a lot from my experiences and other people's experiences. I've also learned a lot because I've had a lot of adult relationships and I've seen a lot and I've experienced a lot and I've heard a lot. And um, so I have some views on, on things just from the school of hard knocks. So that's probably most of it for me. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Join us here more regularly. Uh, you can go to bit.ly forward slash Jack Butler subscribe. 
and that will add you so that you hear of new videos or live streams or anything as soon as they come out. All right, question from Leanne. Hi, Jack. I have a pattern of attracting emotionally unavailable men. And now that I'm dating a guy, I don't trust my feeling that he is not right for me. How can I work through this? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to the this question. Um, that you have a pattern of attracting emotionally unavailable men, right? So again, I do have a lot of videos on this on, on YouTube. I encourage you to check them out. There are, there are many things that can be going on here, right? Let's just imagine for a moment that there is something in you that is attracting that in, right? Not in a way that you're blameworthy, just in, in a way that there might be more awareness that you can bring that actually starts to shift this pattern. So one thing that can happen when you're attracting emotionally unavailable men is that you've stopped trusting yourself, right? So this comes to your, to your second part of your question. It's really hard to trust someone else fully when you're disconnected from your own intuition or when you don't listen to it or when you avoid red flags. So trust starts at home, as I like to say, and that's something you can practice. The best way that I know to practice it is presence because the more present you are, the more information you have, the less you're in your head, the less you're in your fear, the less you're in your doubt. So anything that you can do that increases your presence, meditation, what a th you know, thing I call snug space, where you set up a spot in your house with some cushions and some pillows, and you just kind of get there sometimes, lie down, and just feel, sense into your body, sense into your experience, sense into what's going on in this moment. Um, the other pattern that can be for attracting emotionally unavailable men is that that's kind of what you grew up with, right? So you don't actually have much of a nervous system imprint of what it's like for the trustworthy masculine to show up in your life, right? So sometimes you've just got to learn a new flavor of things, right? If you've never tasted wine, the first time you taste wine, you probably think it's not very nice, right? Or maybe if you're used to having, you know, Swiss cheese or Jack cheese or blue cheese, uh, cheddar cheese, and I give you some blue mole cheese, your system might be like, that doesn't even taste like cheese. I don't like it, right? But over time, you might habituate to a new taste. And it's a similar thing, habituating to a guy that actually wants to show up in a regular, consistent, and trustworthy way. That might feel a bit weird to you. It might feel boring. It might feel like you, you're, this is the thing. Often the unavailable guy is arresting to you. You are, you are trying to convince him of something. You are in this pattern of frustration and unavailability. So I say, look at that in your life. Look at your relationship with frustration. That can be a huge spiritual journey all of itself. What is your relationship with frustration? Because if you've not looked at it, it will probably just keep showing up um, in your relationships. And interview people. Like find someone who's got a guy that's been showing up for them and they have a good relationship with. Or find someone that's you know been in a partnership and you like the guy and kind of get used to like What's that K? What's that uh, kinesthetic? What's that felt sense of when a guy kind of shows up consistently? Because um, you might not have that download and it's not a problem. It's not your fault. You don't need to go rearrange your childhood. You just need to start attuning and habituating to something else. And if you really don't think a guy's right for you and you decide to, to say no, cut him out, if it's really the right guy, it will probably come back around, right? Or he might not be that easy to push away because he actually feels clear that he wants you to be in his life. So don't, don't be afraid. If you've got that much kind of doubt, sometimes it's like, cool, let's actually downshift this and then maybe it will come back to us in a different cycle. Uh, hey, and welcome to those of you that have uh, just joined us. I appreciate you being here. This is a live stream. Uh, I'm talking a little bit about is there such thing as Mr. Right, but I'm welcome and open for questions more broadly. Um, and if you haven't, I want to invite you to download my guide. You can go to becomingtheone.us forward slash checklist. And that is my He's Your Guy checklist. It's got nine points, so you can basically run any guy through. I've been getting great feedback on it. Um, if you've been thinking about a guy, is he showing up? Is he the one? Do I want to keep investing in him? Let me help you. I think this will be a pretty robust thing. Take 15 minutes of your time. And if it's not a good 15 minutes of your time, hit me up and let me know. But I'd be surprised if that is your conclusion. So question here from Liz. Do you think there's a certain age when men get into their masculine energy and want a lifetime partnership? So I'm going to get a little bit conceptual in this question. I hope, I hope I'm not getting too far out there. Um, one approach into this question is that, let's just say traditionally, a lot of men were in their masculine, right? Providers, protectors, hunter-gatherers. And then one of the things that has happened, and I think this is a really good thing, is that we have seen, and there's a long way still to go on this, but we've seen um, more embracing of the feminine in dominant culture. 
right? So whether that's guys being willing to go to therapy, be more in touch with their feelings, be more sensitive and attuned, that whole train has been leaving the station for a while. And I think it's, it's really important. Now, when that's happening, what you tend to get is guys that are sometimes a little bit less than their masculine because they're actually learning to connect with their feminine side, right? My sense is that we all have a masculine and a feminine within us. So when a guy is doing that, he's probably going to show up less strongly in his masculine energy. On the other side of that, there is an opportunity to kind of fully reclaim your masculine energy whilst being in touch with your feminine energy. That's what we call the integrated masculine. A lot of you listening right now, that's probably the flavor of masculine you're going to most appreciate because if you're with a purely masculine guy in the traditional sense of he doesn't have that much access to his feminine, he's probably not going to be available to do some of the work that you want to do in relationship, right? This, this notion of becoming more conscious, more aware, sitting and meditating, going to yoga, eating a, a different type of diet. All these sorts of things are a little bit less on the radar and I'm talking in gross orienting generalization to a traditionally masculine man. So yes, I do think there are stages to this. There might be some guys who from this journey around the clock, if you, you know, this lifetime, they're not actually gonna particularly come into any of their feminine energy. They're gonna be a, a bit more of a traditionally masculine guy. And if you are a bit more of a traditionally feminine woman, that might be exactly right for you. So I'm not actually saying that that's a guy you can't partner with. I just know there's a lot of people in this community for whom that's not quite right for them now because there are certain kinds of things that they wanna do in relationship, right? The notion of being in a conscious relationship is something that you want. And that takes two people that want to become uh, more conscious. So. The other thing that can happen is that I do think guys come into, uh, you know, what some people refer to as king energy, right? Where it's like, I'm kind of clear who I am and I'm kind of clear what I want. And that is a really great energy to build a partnership with, right? Because you're not trying to persuade a guy of the value of relationship. Normally that happens when a guy is enough in his career and mission that he kind of, he's kind of on a trajectory and he's not trying to figure things out. There are stages of masculine development that look a little bit like layers of the onion unfolding, to use the David Data, David Data metaphor. And at that time, it's kind of hard to partner with a guy because he doesn't really know who he is, not in any kind of judgmental way. He's undergoing an important unfolding and possibly even a transformation. But when guys are figuring out who they are, that's typically not when they're in the kind of energy that you want to partner with. You may be their companion. That might work for you, right? But we know that the companion to partner upgrade is not an easy upgrade. It's rare. So if you're, if you're with a guy at that stage of unfolding, you've got to be willing to be his, his companion or not. You know, totally be a choice, but not, not do it as a covert move because I, when he figures out who he is, that he's going to be in partnership with me. Normally, that's just not how the, not, not how the cookie crumbles, as we say. I don't know who says that. I think I, I don't know why I'm putting on a British accent, but we don't even talk about cookies in Britain. So I'm going to say that's a British accent for an Americanism. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Welcome if you've just joined us. I'm taking questions here. Thank you so much for all your engagement and questions and waving at me. I like that. Um, let me see if I've got any more questions. When do you introduce kids in new relationship? Yeah, I would really trust yourself with that. And I think if in doubt, you take longer right? Because if he's going to really be around and, oh, we delayed introducing him to the kids for another month, no big deal, right? The bigger deal is you introduce him to the kids and then he starts to disappear, right? So I think there need to be many conversations before you do that. And I think you need to understand what he wants from relationship, whether he's wants to be with your family, that that's part of the picture, whether he's got his, you know, his own kids or whatever's going on there. Um, and yeah, slowly, slowly does it. Here's the thing as well, right? We know that some guys have a strategy of investment as due diligence. This is a strategy that was most typical for me in the past, where it's like, I'm willing to be in relationship, connect with you, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily like we're a done deal, right? I'm still considering it. And there's a lot of women have this strategy as well. So that's the kind of guy you want to be wary of introducing too quickly, because he needs to get through the three to six month mark for you to actually know Hang on a minute, is, is he hanging around and staying around? And that guy can be quite intense in the first three months so he can look like another guy because he's like, I'm into you. I like this. You're the solution to my problem. You know, many variations of that. So just, just be wary, you know, chill out a bit on it. Take it slow. If he's really going to be a long a long term guy for you, you could take six months, 12 months, two years. If he's really going to be there, um, I think he's, he's really going to be there. So good question. Um, do, 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 do. Once you align, you'll probably change your type in men. Yes, I think that's probably right. Um, all right, so I'm going to scroll down here. Um, Keith Ann Stone, any advice in dealing with a man in, addicted, in active addiction? I'm finding this so prevalent these days. An overuse of alcohol is often acceptable in our society at present. So 
I think you get your choice with this. So whilst it may be true that overuse of alcohol is often acceptable in our society at present, if that's not your ball of wax, that doesn't need to be your ball of wax, right? If that's not your wheelhouse that you want to be playing in, there are plenty of guys, you know, myself included, that don't really drink that much, right? Where it's like pretty much more the exception than the rule. And I also think that segment of society is growing, right? Guys that really take care of themselves, take care of their health. They realize that, you know, alcohol is fun, but it's, it's effectively not something that your body wants to have in it most of the time. So if someone is really in active addiction, um, I would be supporting them to get the right kind of professional treatment. And I would be wary of making any kind of commitment into a relationship, right? Because the pattern I've seen with this is there's a lot of broken promises. You know, until someone has got their clarity and sobriety, they can't necessarily be counted on. And I'm not just saying that judgmentally. I think that's just the nature of the beast that you're dealing with, right? And if we want you to unfold in relationship, to unfold in a way that you can trust more, that you can be sober with someone, you can be in reality, you can be more conscious, all those things are hard if someone's in addiction. Right. So I think you have one choice that says, I'll be your friend and I'll wait for you. Right. But I'm going to be your friend. That's that's a choice. There's another choice that says, I'll be your friend and I'm going to still go and pursue my life because I'm not just going to be on hold for this. Right. And then if it comes back around in the future and you're still available and he's sobered up and has a commitment that you can stand by and you can see as substantive. Great. Go with that. Um, but what we don't want to do, which I've seen so often, is you become uh, somehow you're trying to heal him. Right, or you're you're trying to you see his broken wing and you want to mend it. Much better that he goes and mends that for himself, builds that muscle, breaks that addiction, and then you can see um, what's actually available. And you know, I know that's tough, right? That might be a little bit of tough love. That might be hard for you to hear. That might be the hardest thing for you ever to do to draw a boundary and and actually walk from this. But I think you'll find it might actually serve you in the long run, and it may even serve them as well, right? To realize that actually from this place of still being lacking in sobriety. It's really hard for me to show up as the man that I want to show up for in relationship with you. I can do a much better job when that's not happening. And I might as well marshal all my resources to figure out my problem and, and get there. And I know you might say, well, look, doesn't someone get out of it easier if they have support? That may be true, but there are all sorts of people that can support that don't necessarily want to be this person's partner, right? Let them have a professional healer. Let them have a psychotherapist. Let them have an addiction specialist. Let them have a trauma specialist, whatever they need, and do that work. And... You don't take that on yourself. That's that's my gist with that. Um, Kimberly says, why is online dating over 45 uh, so difficult? Well, <laughs> if, it's any, if it's any reassurance, I think online dating is difficult just per se. You know, I think a lot of younger people also find it difficult, partly because you know, I don't think dating apps are necessarily built. I don't, I'm, I'm being nice here saying necessarily. I don't think they are at all built for long-term relationship, right? And that doesn't mean the long-term relationship can't result from them because there's plenty of opportunity to con connect with people. And it's, it's really just marketing, right? It's a way of introducing yourself. But I think they were more built for engagement and attraction and particularly the kind of attraction that just pops from photos that doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with can you and I be in a long-term compatible partnership, right? Very good for hitting our chemicals, very good for hitting our sexuality and our animal senses, and that's all important stuff to be included. But that doesn't really tell you what's, what's the likelihood that you and I can do something a bit more meaningful. So I'm a fan as much as possible of meeting people in online context where the context isn't a dating app, right? The context is on mutual interest whatever that may be, you know, knitting, hiking, bowling, baking, dancing, prayer, meditation, religion, atheism, whatever it is, fi find the people that share some of your worldview and then strike up some conversations, right? And if you can get out in the real world, you know, lockdown notwithstanding, you know, go to the class, go to the seminar, go to the rambling club, go to the walking dinner, do, just do the thing that's going to have you meet some people because I think most of us get a little bit more traction there. One of the challenges with these dating apps is that the state of mind that a lot of people are using them in, even if that's not ultimately the thing they just want, I think a lot of it is I'm bored, right? It's like I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm bored. I'm now bombarded with, you know, I've just seen 100 pictures of different women in the last, you know, 10 minutes. Like that's probably not good for our neuropsychology, right? So... And just, just a little bit of, of realistic. The more you can take this stuff and move it into a more real platform, I think the easier time you'll have. Um, Olivera saying, I couldn't do online, hated the whole process. Knitting, LOL. You don't like knitting? My mom likes knitting. She's knitting for my, uh, I got six nieces and nephews. 
And apparently one of them hadn't yet had the jumper knitted. So that's happening at the moment. Not that I can knit. <laughs> um, Libera says, I love all your videos. I'm such a huge fan. Thank you so much. I've ended the most toxic relationship. Thanks to you. He wasn't, he wasn't my guy. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, all right. DC says, do I wait for him to come to me and then express my feelings or should I express my feelings regardless? I don't want to kill attraction. Um, I'm curious if there's any context to that, right? Like I'm sensing maybe you're dating and you've got some feelings and maybe he hasn't expressed feelings and you're wondering um, whether to go first. I don't think there's a golden rule to this. I do think if you can't be with non-reciprocation, then maybe don't express those feelings, right? Maybe express them to your journal or your best friend. Um, but if you can express your feelings in an unattached way, I think it's a beautiful thing, you know? I mean. It's not all the time that we have feelings, so so share them. Um, if you saying you have feelings for me kills our attraction, I don't think I'm your guy. Normally, if I'm your guy and you say you've got feelings for me, I'm like, that's dope. Like, love hearing that. Even if I'm not ready to reveal any of my experience or sharing, inside I'm going to be having like, that's cool that you revealed that. So I think it takes courage, um, but I think we need to do it with uh, non-attachment. Do, do, do. All right, I'm scrolling back up here. Simpler question, says K Meerkat. I ghosted after a year. Do they return? What should I do? Heartbroken. Um, so my general sense, without knowing too much of the detail, is that when a guy ghosts you, and that's like, you know, I haven't even let you know what's going on in my world. I've just kind of dropped the connection and I haven't taken the care to let you know, I don't think he's your guy, right? Even if I'm having the experience, wow, I so like you, and for some reason, this is not the right season, right? I I'm so mired in my you know, career challenges, or I'm about to move across the country, or I'm taking care of an elderly parent, or I've got to work offshore, right? So it's not gonna work right now. But I can let you know that. I can be like, damn, I'm into you, and I just don't think this is the right season, so I'm actually, I'm gonna downshift this in service of you and me, because I can't show up in the way that I want. But if I ghost you and I just drop off the map, the lack of care in that, if we've been together for a year, right? If, if we had two dates and I didn't follow up, you, know, you and I can argue whether that's ghosting. But if we've been together for a year, and I suddenly drop off the map, I'm not too sure about that. Um, I don't think I would be keen to be letting that guy back in my life. Um, I would have to see something very substantive that had shifted, but I'm, you know, probabilistically, I don't think that's likely to happen. Mm. Uh, Melissa says, hi, Jack, love what you do. How can we shift a relationship from companionship to partnership? And what are the challenges we can face? So I don't actually recommend trying to do that. I recommend trying to find something that off the bat is available for partnership. I think that's so much easier, right? Than trying to persuade someone that has had you maybe in the friend zone or it's been kind of casual. Basically, here's the ideal. You don't want to be persuading your guy that he wants to be with you, right? He wants already to be with you. That's, that's the ideal. And I don't know that I even want you to stray too far from that. Um, it's really cool, and this is part of what makes me your guy, if you can influence me, right? I'm available to impact. There's a lot of research that shows that particularly when men can show up in a relationship and be available for influence, it's a great thing for long-term partnership and marriage. But companionship is a different energy normally than partnership, right? It's like we like hanging out, but I just don't, I don't want to have an obligation to you. I don't want to have a commitment to you. I don't want to deepen the commitments and mutual obligations that we have. So... If you are with someone and you're like, damn, I really wish you were my partner and only companionship's available, I would downshift and let them know that. Hey, I really like you. If you were available for partnership, I would be very interested to pursue that. My estimation, tell me if I'm wrong, is that that's not actually available right now. You don't want that. It's not the season or you don't want that with me. And in service of us both getting more of what we want, I'm actually going to downshift the connection rather than covertly hang on to something and hope one day it, it shifts and upgrades. He can always come back around, right? If it's that he's working offshore, maybe that contract finishes in, in a year and he's now available. Meanwhile, you live your life. But if you haven't found someone, you can be available to dating them, right? So there's something powerful in this, like, you know, I sometimes call it zero one. It's kind of like tech binary thinking, right? Either we are available for a partnership as a one or everything else is a zero. 
And that just keeps it simple. And maybe there's a few situations in life that there's a little bit of gray, but most of the time there's actually a little bit more clarity available than we give ourselves credit for. What's difficult is we develop feelings and so it's hard to do this thing that's maybe a little bit more rational or we develop false expectations or we live in false hope. Maybe, maybe he can change. Maybe one day he'll be available. And I much rather people deal in true hope, which is you don't have to run any kind of false fantasy on yourself. It's actually, it's hope because things do improve and get better, but it's not based on a story or a narrative that you have to overlay. Coda says, is it okay to initiate contact with a guy who was honest and said it wasn't his season to partner a couple of years later? Uh, sure. I'm curious why he's not coming back round, right? So that's the ideal in this situation is he says, I've had my sabbatical or I've done my two years or I've worked offshore or I've been dating around, whatever I've been doing. Now I'm ready to settle down. And that's why I've given you a call because I always appreciated you. And I always thought that if I was ready to settle down, you'd be the person I'd call, right? That's what's really cool. So if that's not happening, let's get curious. Why is that not happening? But if you want to reach out and say, look, you know, I'm just checking in. I still think of you. Um, I don't know that there's a huge amount of harm in that. Again, if you're not really attached too much to the outcome. Uh, when you say downshift, can you explain how you do that? Is that a conversation or do you just stop investing as much? So I'm a fan of explicit conversation wherever possible. Um, you might find your language, you know, maybe it's not downshift. Maybe it's like, I want to take the romantic piece off the table and I'm still available for friendship. I'm not a huge fan of being available for friendship in the short term because I think it's much better to, uh, I think it's much better to have a clean break. And then if there's a friendship that authentically wants to arise in the future, but we're not sort of, you know, friendship proxy for maybe I might sleep with you at some point, I don't know, or maybe I still have feelings and I can covertly keep a kind of cord between us. Um, I'm a little bit wary of that. So I'm, uh, you know, again, I might have my way of saying it. You might like my way of saying it. You might not. It's easy for me to say it because I'm not trying to downshift, right? So it's a little bit harder when you're in the actual, your feet are in the fire. You don't have to do it perfectly. Permission to be messy, permission to be clumsy, permission to be awkward. The most important thing is you do it, right? It's the same thing if you're gonna fire someone, you know, you're a boss or you have your own business or you have a downline and you've got to fire someone, of course, say it with as much care and consideration as you can. But at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's an act that needs to happen if that's what's gonna happen. And it's more important that it happens than you kind of delay it, second think it, you know, wrap yourself up around it. Because there's no great way to tell someone bad news, right? If they actually want to still be in relationship with you, there's no great way to do it. There's just maybe a little bit more nuance or a little bit more care. But ultimately, you've got to put yourself out there um, and make it happen. So I want to let you know, I'm going to be continuing here. If you're watching this at the moment on Instagram, you might want to come over to Facebook because Instagram is going to tap out on the hour mark. So that's seven minutes from now. So just a heads up for that. Thank you so much for your engagement there. Um, you're welcome to come over on Facebook or on YouTube. Any of you that joined us, I'm here. I'm live. I need a drink. I've been talking a lot. That won't surprise you, will it? Jack talking a lot on a live stream. Okay, here we go. More questions. Keep them coming. Any advice for dating in your 50s, says Joanna. I find most with baggage and it's tough to see if they have unpacked it. Yeah, I mean, if we accept that we all have baggage, right? You and I are not gonna get rid of our Samsonites anytime soon, right? We may have a little bit more, a little bit less, but we're all gonna have wounds, defenses. We all survived childhood. We were all unseen in certain ways. We've all had bad relationship experiences, mostly, by the, not, not just bad relationship experiences, but most of us by the time we're in our 50s, certainly, but even earlier in life, we've had some bad experiences. So, you know, um, what you probably want is a guy that's doing his work right? Can you, can you discern a guy that's doing his work? Now, why I'm saying that is because I sometimes think the direction of travel is more important than the destination because you and I aren't going to stop doing our work anytime soon, right? We're all going to be continuing to become more aware, more conscious, work those edges, uncover more patterns. That's probably ongoing for most of us, right? I don't think there's many of us that are fully baked in that direction. So I would rather know that there's a guy, particularly if you're someone that wants a conscious relationship, right? Relationship is path, relationship is going to grow you. You need a guy that's minimally interested in that direction. And there is a little bit of an age barrier there possibly because maybe it's true that there are slightly more in the younger generation of men that are doing that work possibly, but there's also enough and you, you only need one guy, right? So you and I don't need to get stuck too much on the sociological analysis. For you right now in relationship, you just need to find one guy that wants to do that. And there's plenty of guys that you know meditate, go to yoga, um, have been to workshops, seminars, um, are on a spiritual path. 
Um, so I wouldn't get too worried about the baggage in the sense that I, I'm curious what the, the magnetism is to that, or just maybe a better way of saying that is trust yourself, right? You'll know if there's a guy in front of you that you want to relate with. And if not, you know, you might have to sift through more guys. Um, one challenge I have noticed for, so let's call it conscious women in their fifties is that sometimes they are attracted to guys who've done pretty well in the other domains of life, right? Maybe they're materially successful. Maybe they are able to retire or they're on the point of retirement, but the whole inner thing has not really come online and maybe it actually won't. Maybe they're more worried in their retirement about, you know, I don't know, playing golf or whatever they're going to do. Um, so that can be a thing. And I don't think it's ideal to give up on your conscious piece, right? So maybe there's a guy that is really secure in his masculine. He's got his stuff together. He could look after you, provide for you and all that. And there's this thing that we're now able to do in relationship where we are using it to become more conscious. And I, I think that's an important piece. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give up on that too prematurely. Uh, welcome. We've got some more people joining us. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm doing a bit of a Q&A right now. Um, let's uh, see what we've got here. The Duchess of Essex. I'm not sure. Is that an official title? I'm not sure that is, but I like that. I just discovered you this weekend. Thank you for being such a beautiful light to show us a better way. You're welcome. I appreciate any light that you find in me and this work. Um, Okay, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, Mary Kay, I like this. Hiya, Jack. Let's not persuade the giant red flags to become green ones. <laughs> totally. Yeah, let's, uh, let's keep the colors. No color blindness here. Melly X says, hi, Jack. I love your videos. Do you have a specific dating app you recommend and why? Um, <clears throat> so actually, my main recommendation is to pursue things other than dating apps. So that would be my main answer to this is to find, you know, if you're into music, download the karaoke app, right? If you're into fitness, download the Strava app. If you're into hiking, download the all trails app, right? Download the domain specific apps, particularly if they have follow functions or the ability to, to engage socially. And I would try some of that, you know, like people's stuff, hit them up, say, hey, thanks for your feedback on that trail. I really appreciate it. Are there any others you recommend? Be the first to say hello, get the conversation going. I'm more of a fan of that. Um, it's partly because, you know, from my level of analysis, I, and I haven't put a huge amount of resource into this, I'm not sure that the way that a lot of these apps are thinking about compatibility is a way that I would buy into. And that's not to say that I'm right and they're wrong. I'm just saying it might be a little different. And I think a lot of it is geared towards engagement and kind of what we what I call unconscious attraction. So that that's sometimes the limitation of them, but they're just marketing, right? It's a bit like saying, you know, is it better to be on Facebook or Instagram, right? Or is it better to be on YouTube or on Medium? It's like, whatever works at one level, right? If you're, if you're on an app and the energy you bring into it is I'm tired and I'm frustrated, that's probably not gonna have you in the vibration that's gonna call in what you want. So also play in the places that you like to play. And actually for some of you, online is just not gonna be it. You don't like it, it doesn't bring you alive you feel defended, it's, you have bad experiences, and maybe you, you just prioritize a, an in-person strategy, right? I mean, again, without going too business on you, sales and marketing, it's kind of like whatever works. For some people, they can do all their marketing online, right? For some other people, online isn't their thing, but you know, put them in a bar and they can talk anyone into you know, having a meeting with them, right? I, I had a former mentor of mine back in the 2000s, as it was the former global CEO of Adidas, and you know, he was really old school, loved him to bits. But for him, everything was, you know, with a pen in a calendar with a circle around it. Uh, nothing was happening online. But yet, you know, in his world, that was perfectly fine. He had great relationships with people, was super personable and did everything in person. So, you know, feel free to play to some of your strengths. Um, if you're jaded in, uh, in a thing, I would let it go. Even if you just say for a week, I'm going to downshift. Um, I would let it go and try and bring where you can bring your best energy. Uh, all right, just a quick reminder to you guys on Instagram, we're coming into the last minute here. Instagram will click off on the hour. So come join us. We're going to be continuing here on Facebook and on YouTube. If you just pop over to my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash real Jack Butler, uh, you'll see it there. It will be the first video showing or also on my YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate all your engagement, you Insta folks. Lots of love to you. All right, moving on. Do, 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 do. Marie says, how do I deal with a guy with trauma in relationships? He wouldn't want me to post anything about him on social media. 
I'm just proud of him. What can I do to understand him? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so there may be different things going on here, right? May, and you might know more, obviously, about the context. But um, plenty of people aren't that into to, to social media. Um, I actually just today shot a video um, for the people that are in my live program, real relationship program. I shot a video called The Value of Privacy. And basically, it was having you consider um, see you to you guys on Instagram. Thanks for being here. Come over. We're on Facebook. Um, that you know, what is your relationship with privacy? Is it something that uh, that you value? Is it something that you have a relationship with? Right? Because if you don't value privacy, it's going to be hard to value it in someone else. Doesn't mean you need to value it the same. But I'm into a thing called values metabolism. Big fancy phrase. Basically means how can I learn to value more things? And one of the ways you can do that is just by really getting in touch with a part of you that may like seclusion or time on your own or not everyone knowing all your business. So the more you do that, probably the more aligned you can be because you can find a value in common. Um, there are probably a myriad ways that you can express that you are proud of him without it having to be on social media, right? You can tell your friends, you can tell him, you can organize a surprise party for him, you can give him gift, you, you can verbally appreciate him. So. If that domain isn't right for him, yeah, maybe that's just going to be a limitation in your connection, right? All can all relationships have limitations. You just need to find the person that you can be with their limitations, right? Or be with the real limitations um, in the relationship. The other thing you can do is just ask him a lot of open-ended questions. Like, hey, I'm curious about the social media thing. Like, what's your experience of that? When did that develop? Has that always been true for you? Are there any experiences that have that be true for you? Um, what do you think when you see people posting on social media? What is your view of social media? I mean, there's lots that you can, of territory that you could probably open up if you want to um, understand him more. Um, if he's really got trauma, I would let him figure that out with someone else, right? So that's not your job. That's a therapist's job, a coach's job, someone that can help him with that if he wants to. Um, it much be better if that came from his own initiative. Um, and, you know, we all, again, I don't know the context. We all have trauma, right? Show me someone that doesn't have some trauma, right? Some of our traumas are more obvious. Sometimes we need to deal with it with someone that's got a specialism in that. So I would, I would gently support him, uh, his own initiative, um, in that direction. Lucy H says, hi, Jack. Finally caught you live. Awesome. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. Um, your question is, what do they want if we stopped talking dating over six months ago and now a friend requesting following social media but does not speak up a message? I mean, who knows? Who knows? Guys want all sorts of things. Here's the truth that I've come across. Most guys want connection at nearly every stage and season of their life, right? So in simple speak, I think there are two types of people. There are the people who like to be in touch with their exes and there are the people who are like, hell no, that's not going to happen, right? So he might be someone who likes to be in touch with his exes. He may still feel a connection with you, whether that's I'm actually available for something substantive. If he's not offering that, I would not assume that. So, you know, a lot of guys like to be friendly. They don't like to completely lose the connection. So I wouldn't read too much into it. If it's bothering you, don't, don't accept the request. Have him unfollow. You know, that's totally fine. You know, honor your authentic boundary in this because there can be a lot of sort of noise and clinging on. You know, and maybe even back in the day, sometimes unconsciously, it wasn't so much like following people on social media, but I might have been this guy, like someone I had a connection with, you know, maybe it was romantic, maybe it was potentially romantic, and then months go by, and then I happen to be in their area, and I hit them up. I'm not just looking for a booty call, I'm looking for like some connection, like, hey, I still feel connected to you. But if that's not working in your world, you have absolutely the right to not, not engage with that. Like, particularly if that's starting to be confusing, which I'm sensing from your question, maybe it is, um, I would feel free to disengage. I don't think it's, it's going anywhere, and I don't think it merits um, too much of your time and attention. Here's my lady giving me the heart. Thank you, sweetie. I appreciate that. Uh, Keith Anstone says, thank you, Jack. Your words are bringing me clarity. Awesome. You'll know that. There's few things I'm more of a fan of than clarity. Maybe sobriety. Sobriety is the new sexy, but clarity is pretty close there behind. Aisha, thanks for joining us. I know you're over on Instagram. Thanks to all of or any of you that have come over. Um, and you're welcome, Marie, for answering your question. So I'm going to flip back through here. Let me know. If I didn't get to your question, feel free to repost it because I tried to sweep through. Um, Lynetta, I met my now husband online dating site. We've been married for four years. Awesome. Love hearing that. I, yeah, totally accept that there are lots of um, stories like you, particularly just that this has also become the dominant place that we go 
you know, historically, I think we went to, you know, the bar or a disco or a nightclub. And I think often now we go online first, right? So, um, do, 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 do. Question from Panama. How can we tell the difference between authentically knowing a man isn't right for us and not wanting a man because we aren't used to kind, masculine behavior? That's a good question. I'm sure a lot of people can um, relate to that. So what I would say is what's your relationship with knowing in the other areas of your life, right? Because if you have a relationship with kind of knowing, intuition, I think it's a similar thing that can operate in relationship. It's just sometimes a bit harder because we can also have kind of feelings and chemistry and other things that are um, in the mix with us. Um, if you haven't uh, taken the three keys to being relationship ready webinar, um, it's posted under a lot of my YouTube videos, I would encourage you to, uh, to go take that because in that webinar, uh, one of the things that we talk about is the defender archetype um, that tends to defend against intimacy, right? So this, I'm not used to kind masculine behavior. Sometimes that can show up in an archetype where we unconsciously kind of keep men's at arm length, kind of push them away. We kind of overvalue our independence. Um, I'm curious what your intuition about this is, right? Because if a guy's being kind, I'm curious why you'd be uh, concluding that he isn't right for you. Right, unless somehow you're like he's kind and he's not maybe strong or he's not enough in his masculine. So feel free to give me um, another level of detail. And I'll always say this, right? If you don't know, it's okay. It's okay to be in the experience of I don't know or I don't yet know. What gets difficult is when our doubt creeps in that says, well, you should know, you should know better. So if I don't know, give my give me give yourself some more time. Give it another month. Keep keep inviting your knowing. Hit your journal, process with your friends, like whatever the, the mechanisms by which you find clarity. Let that be so. All right? Let that be so. It's fine to take your time. If a guy is really meant to be your guy, it will be revealed to you. And you can kind of make that your prayer. You don't have to be religious necessarily, just life, you know, God, whatever. Show me. Let me know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Let me know. I really want clarity and I'm going to pray and I'm going to put the time in to find out. Um, we can't ask any more of that than you, right? You just, you're just you asking, you're, you're trying to find clarity. You're doing your best to not get into your reactive head, so you're not going to loop. Quiet. You know, how does it occur to you when you're in nature? How does it occur to you when you're in a shower? How does it occur to you when you're fully relaxed in your nervous system? All right, give this video a like if you haven't. I'll appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here, your questions and engagement. Also, if you haven't got my He's Your Guy checklist and you have a guy and you're wondering, is he my guy? This could be really helpful for you. Becoming the one.us forward slash checklist is free download. Just gets emailed across to you. And uh, I've gotten really great feedback for it. If you haven't got it, I would get it. If I didn't have it, I would go get it. Maybe I'm biased. Uh, Jenny says, oh, I love the Snug Space idea. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that, you know, I'm going to say that changed my life, right? I'm a little bit wary in my kind of uh, Britishness of some of these claims of, you know, what things change people's lives, right? But this, I think, was something that changed my life. I spent a lot of time in 2015, 2016. I was lucky. I had a huge living space overlooking a mountain, Stella View. And it was also a cycle that wasn't so work-oriented for me. And I wasn't in committed relationships. So I basically had a comforter, duvet in Brit speak, and I would lay, I have it permanently out just with some cushions around it. And I would put on some music and I would just kind of be with myself, kind of go fetal, kind of notice. To, to a former Jack, that would have been a very strange thing to do. But basically two questions, what am I sensing? What am I feeling? Particularly for me, what am I feeling? It's a little bit harder to get close to if I'm kind of go, 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 just kind of drop it in. So you may have that kind of space in your house. It may be something that you can just, you know, occasionally on your bed, just take perhaps some cushions from your living room, stick them on your bed, just kind of get quiet with yourself. Maybe you have a favorite rug or a blanket or something that's anything that's soft or textured that invites you into your senses and that invites you to feel safe, held and relaxed. That's that's the aim of this. And it's about I think what in technical speak we would call introverted feeling, right? Your ability to sense inwards to what you're feeling yourself. I was always good at extroverted, extroverted feeling, which is uh, can I feel other people's feelings, right? Can I tune into you? But it, it's harder and took me a bit longer and still sometimes I'm not as good as just, hey, tuning into me. Kay says, thank you, love your videos. I love how direct you are. Thank you so much from Australia. Awesome, thank you for joining from Australia. I appreciate that. Um, 
Lorelei, hope I'm saying that right, and world. Love your wisdom. Any tips on just enjoying your relationship instead of future projecting worrying even when words and actions align? Presence, probably. I don't know if that's a boring answer. But yeah, because what's one of the main ways that we lose presence to the future, right? I start to think, anticipate, worry, doubt. So anytime that I can stay in the here and now, I'm going to have an, an easier time just enjoying the relationship, right? Taking it moment by moment, day by day. So anything that you do in your life that can have you practice being more present, I think will help show up in your relationships. The other thing you can do is be present moment when you're relating. Like notice what's here right now. What's in our space? What am I feeling? What am I noticing about being in contact with you? Because the more you do that, the more present you are in the actual relationship, right? Like we can actually notice the things here. Um, and also anything that helps you cultivate trust in your life, right? Trust is the, I trust that the future will unfold in a way that's going to be okay for me. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I might get knocks. I might get real challenges, right? But just this general sense that life is for me, not against me. So things unfold for my highest. And, you know, that might be hard or you may have had experiences where you're like, absolutely not. That doesn't feel true to me. Um, but anything that we can do to increase our sense of basic trust that life is okay and life will be okay uh, is a good thing. And again, there's a relationship between trust and presence. It's hard to trust fully if you're spun out in your head, right? So for me, some of the things that really help just enjoying life is um, spending more time relaxing, right? More candles, more low lights, more salt lamps, more baths, not showers. Baths tend to relax me. Epsom salts, magnesium, time in nature, time meditating, time listening to music that uplifts you, for me, also time listening to music that's classical, tends to relax my nervous system more. Unscheduled time, freewheeling time, right? Freewheeling, I don't know what I'm gonna do today. I'm just gonna follow my instincts. I'm gonna get in my car, just start driving. Don't know where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna walk out of my house, I'm gonna take my bike, don't know where I'm gonna go. So anything that just allows you to enjoy the unfolding because that's the same thing that you're asking to do in your relationship, right? Can I just enjoy the unfolding of this relationship? Can you enjoy the unfolding of anything in your life? Can you have an unscheduled Sunday and enjoy it? Or does that sort of have a sense I'm not in control? Or does that bring things up for you? So what's your relationship with unknowingness is another way um, of orienting to that question. But thank you. I appreciate it. Celia says, what is considered an average or healthy amount of time for grieving or getting over an ex? I do think this is really specific to the circumstances, right? So how long have you been connected? What was the circumstance of the unwinding? Did you want it to end or did they want it to end? Um, uh, have they been available to kind of process it with you, right? Was it just a sudden ghosting? Like might be different than, hey, I don't want to be with you, but I don't have to disappear today. Like we can still get together. We can talk it through. Um, the real key to this is to drop the stories. I think that's the main thing that keeps us stuck, right? The main thing that keeps us stuck is I have a story that I did something wrong or that maybe it could be different in the future or maybe I'm unlovable or I'm wanted or woe betide me, nothing ever goes my way, I'll never find another guy. If you can experience your feelings directly without story, which is just let me feel my sadness, let me actually feel it, it tends to move through quicker, right? It tends to be more like weather than a climate, right? Weather that can pass through. So as long as you've still got feelings coming that you're not trying to amp up yourself by holding on to them or creating a narrative around them, then a healthy amount of time is as long as it takes, right? You know, how long does it take to find a job? You know, sometimes it's tomorrow, sometimes it's a year. You know, it's like that that's life that's sort of above my pay grade, it's probably above both of our pay grades. Um, particularly if you're turning to it, right? Sometimes people just try and get on with their life and they basically don't look at their grief. They just get busy. Then it tends to stay around. It's just kind of under the surface. But if you're finding time regularly to turn towards it, you're not avoiding yourself, you're not dissociating from yourself, then you know, let, let it take its time. You'll know when it's done because it will be done, right? And I don't want to sound vague in saying that. I just think that's the true process uh, to go through. Remen is joining us from Bangladesh. Welcome. I'm so depressed about everything, everything like family and friendship. What should I do? So <clears throat> if you're really depressed in the way that's, you know, we might call clinical depression, you probably do need to get some professional support. Some of the things that if it's not gotten to that extent that can help, for a lot of us, spending time in the natural world has an antidepressive quality. 
doing anything you can to improve your sleep hygiene, right? Your ability to sleep through the night. So that might include things like looking at um, what you eat and drink in the three to four hours before you go to sleep. Um, it might look like having less screen time before you sleep. It might look like having no lights or low lights in the last two or more hours before you sleep. Um, it might look like changing some things physically, like pillows, mattresses. I'm definitely a fan of blackout curtains. I find it really hard to sleep urban these days. I grew up rurally. I'm lucky my parents actually still live in the house I was born in. When I visit with them, I sleep really well because it's quiet, it's nature. The only things you tend to hear are birds, animals, um, sometimes cockerels early in the morning, which is not so great. Um, but it's dark, right? There's not the light pollution. So anything you can do, you know, sleep mask, blackout curtains, because sleep is, is, is a regenerative process, right? So much stuff, more than I even understand, gets worked out in our sleep. So if your sleep is being deprived or compromised, that's going to have a huge effect on your mental and emotional well-being. Um, also, look at your support network, right? Like, so it's I'm, everything like family and friendship. Maybe it's time for some new friendships. How authentic are your friendships? How much do your friendships lift you up? How much can you be truthful, revealed in your friendships? You know, there's seasons to friendship. Not every friend has to be with us for life. Sometimes it's beautiful and we honor what it was and it's not what that is now and we need something new. Sometimes we need a bit of time and space away from our families, right? I think I benefited hugely from having a period of time in my you know, late 20s, early 30s where I was a little bit less connected to family because I was figuring out so much stuff for myself, right? So if family isn't doing it for you right now, you don't need to, you know, Toss them away, just, yeah, ebb and flow. Maybe this is a season where you're going to more individuate and differentiate and pursue your own dreams and your own vision for your life. Um, also look at your diet, right? I, this is, I'm not any diet expert, but we know that a lot of depression can also be linked to gut health. So there might be some health things that you want to explore. Um, do a commitment inventory, right? Get a sheet of paper. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Get the get your pen and just put down everything that's in your life, everything that takes your time and energy and money. Gym membership, shopping, looking after my aunt, my boyfriend, my career, my self-improvement, my meditation practice, my yoga, whatever it is that you put your time and attention on. Put it down, put an amount of time next to it, and then look at it and notice what is your commitment level to those things. Like, do you really care about them? Is there meaning and purpose? that is fulfilling to you. And if it's not, get ruthless. Nick some things, drop some things from your life. Even just temporarily put things on hold, what we call backburnering. Because the more you're doing things in your life that fill you up energetically, the more you're gonna be resistant to depression, right? So notice those things. And often when we do the commitment inventory, people look at it and they say, wow, I'm habitually overcommitted and I didn't even realize. So I'm gonna cut some things back because I'm busy, 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 go, 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 but it's not actually filling my cup, right? So I think often when we're in the orientation of depression, less might be more if we can focus on the things that are really quality and nutritious to us and maybe drop your ideas about that. We all have ideas like, oh, I should do this thing or I should be happy in my career. What's true? What is actually filling your cup up, right? And most of us benefit from more contact with people than less if it's the right sort of contact with people. So, you know, find some people, you know, maybe even enlist some people that are going to be your champions for this time of your life where maybe you need to, you need a little bit um, of a pickup. And then the other thing is normally there are cognitive structures that have us depressed, right? Ways of thinking, habitual patterns and preoccupied, preoccupied thinking. So what is that for you? Are there, are there narratives about yourself? Are there narratives about life? You know, there's a way that depression can sometimes be in a season almost useful or necessary because it's like something has ended and something new is starting. And that in-between period can be difficult, right? I know that when my life in England was just kind of dissolving, I had a lot of fear. I found it really hard to be productive, right? I went from probably being hopefully one of the more high performers in you know, a business that I'd started to being probably the least performing member of the team. I couldn't find motivation to do anything. So if that's true for you, it might be that there's a big change that's coming and actually you need to let some stuff go and trust life to hold you through this period of transition in your life. So I'm giving you a bit of a smorgasbord there, but I hope some of that stuff's helpful. Um, don't lose faith, right? Life is tough and life has tough times, but normally that's because life is growing us and it's something that's going to, you know, something that we've been attached to needs to release or we need to let go of it. Um, or we need to just understand that, yeah, not everything in life is happy, happy, happy all the time. And life is growing us by giving us some more difficult experiences that are going to grow us or realize that we need to have a relationship with some of our darker side and darker emotions. But if you're stuck in that pattern for a long time, definitely get support, right? There's plenty of really cool 
um, therapy-based apps now that are, are more affordable where you can leave voice messages for therapists that get back to you within a day. Talk, find people, do what you need to do, scream, dance, like do what you need to do, shake it out, find some practices that move energy through your body. A lot of depression comes from stuck energy, right? What can you do? What can you do to move energy, right? Dance, yoga, hike, run. Sometimes just running, even if it's not your thing, because it's hard to be depressed when your body is screaming for oxygen, right? So look, I'm not an expert in depression. I just think there's a lot of things that you can try before you decide that that is the life um, that's going to be yours. All right. I'm flicking back to more recently. Thank you so much for all these questions. If you've just joined us, welcome. I appreciate there's so many of you here uh, spontaneously on a Monday evening US time. I know for some of you, this is Tuesday. Uh, like this video if you haven't liked it. Subscribe to my channel. I'm just going to post a subscribe link here. This is a one-touch subscribe, or you can hit uh, the button that you may be seeing uh, on the right-hand corner of your screen. For some of you, you're seeing that. But otherwise, it's bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash Jack Butler, subscribe. We'll subscribe to the channel so you hear of new videos as soon as they come out. You also get notified whenever I go live, which is probably something I will be doing more of in the second half of this year once I've had a little bit of downtime this summer. Rochelle says, hi from Hawaii. I love watching your videos. They've helped me a lot. Awesome. Uh, welcome to Hawaii. I, uh, I was watching a little bit of a documentary uh, when I was actually at my parents over Christmas and some of the stuff going on in Hawaii looked absolutely amazing and the, the types of species that aren't found in other places and the, uh, the activity in the ocean looked incredible. Um, Lucy says, PS, do more lives, please. Awesome. Thank you, Marie. Like and share. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, like this and share this video as well. That helps us get the word out. It also supports me to be able to do more of these. So the more, the more people come, generally, the easier it is for me to put time aside to doing this. How long, says Josephine, is being single healthy? Again, I don't think there's a definitive answer to that. I think there's like a true path in your life, right? For some of us, we may be single for years, and that is exactly right, because actually no one has come into our life that is worthy of us forming a relationship with, um, or we're at a stage in our life where life wants us for singleness, right? Both singleness and relationship are gifts, in my view. They have different gifts, different opportunities. If you've never had a significant amount of your time in life as an adult on your own, being single can be the most healthy thing, right? If I'm single, but I never experienced the gift in it, that can be problematic. So you might want to connect with what are the, you know, the gifts of singleness include in individuation and differentiation, right? The ability to really focus on me, focus on my adult maturity, my path, my maturation, um, other gifts of singleness can include not having obligations, right? Being flexible, the ability to move, the ability to travel easily, the ability to try certain things. Um, not everyone has the ability to just up sticks, and maybe you do. So enjoy the gifts of singleness because at some point you'll have the gift of relationship, right? And some of those gifts won't be so prevalent perhaps or they'll just look a bit different. Um, I wouldn't put a timeline on it. I would get more curious about, is there anything blocking you from bringing relationship into your life? Because you know, if you are struggling to get dates or you're struggling to make connections with men or you have one or two dates and then it never upshifts into an actual ongoing connection and relationship, that's what I would be a little bit more curious about. Is there anything there that uh, you need to relax or address? Is there a, an issue with control or trust? Is there an issue with being in touch with your feminine side? Um, are you nice to people, but you don't reveal what's actually authentically true? Is there being more in touch with your boundaries or your dark side? What's going on there? That, that's what my curiosity would be for you. But thank you for the question. Lucy says, thank you. And yes, boundaries. I prefer the good old upfront communication. Clarity and sobriety. <laughs> you rock. Awesome. That should be the name of my new band. Clarity and sobriety. <laughs> I like it. I often find myself saying he's not my guy when dating. It helps me filter and move on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that that's become a little bit of a, a sort of watch phrase, so to speak, uh, in this community. And again, if you've just joined us and you want to have some support on is he your guy, I'm just putting the link here in the, win in the window in the chat, uh, forward slash checklist. That's my he's your guy checklist. And there are nine points on there. I've gotten great feedback on this. You can run any guy through them. It takes you 15 minutes. If at the end of that, you still don't have clarity as to whether this guy's your guy, you can just send me an email and uh, I'll help you. But most people get clarity from going through that checklist. Lots of thanks here, Angela. I appreciate that. Um, Lorelai, what's your relationship with unknowing? That was deep. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, it's a really important thing, I think. It is deep, but it's also really meaningful. 
What do you learn from your free time? Is it important to have similar habits as your partner? Uh, yes and no. So we were actually just talking about this yesterday. We were on a hike and saying, isn't it great that we like a lot of the same things? You know, whether that's hiking or it's reading or it's adventures, travel, movies, family, connection, similar sorts of films, you know, cooking, home time, like the list goes on. So that that is useful to have ease with we want to do some of the same things but we're also going to be different human beings so we don't need to like all the same things i think it's a matter of this right if we have no interest in common it's probably going to be a lot harder if we have some or many interests in common i don't know what this is the international sign for jack's talking bull right now um if we have i don't know what i'm doing if we have some stuff in common you get what i'm doing come on humor me it's going to be a little bit easier um, but I don't have any hard and fast rules, right? Sometimes people make relationships work where they're actually relatively independent people and they like that. It, it, it's more useful if you both want to have a somewhat similar amount of connection. I think that is a good thing, but it won't be exactly the same. It will ebb and flow. Sometimes one partner wants more connection, one wants less. That's totally fine. Um, what's probably even more important than habits, I think, is the deeper stuff. Worldview. What do you think life is? What do you take the self to be? What do you think relationship is? What's the purpose of relationship and values? What do we really value? Not just the nice stuff that we say we value, right? Like, you know, I value spontaneity or I value adventure. Great. But also the unconscious stuff that we value. Um, how do we orient to money um, from an enneagrammatic perspective, self-preservation, social and sexual? Like which one of those are we unconsciously putting attention on, right? Because if you're constantly putting attention on the community and the group, and that's where you want to put your attention and spend your money and resources and time, and I'm very much self-preservation, which is about us, our home, our bodies, our time, energy, money, bank balance, we might start to have some tension there. So I often think unconscious values are even more important than conscious values. Angie, there may not be Mr. Right, but I'm sure there Mr. Wrongs. Yeah, give us a one in the comments if you can relate to that. Just type the number one. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Jenny says, I love that relationship with unknowing too. That's a very insightful place from which to approach a relationship. That speaks to me deeply. Awesome. I'm super glad that that was resonating with you guys. Um, Debbie says, love you and all your videos. This live especially just shared with my daughter. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Yeah, if you haven't, give this a like, share it out. Let's uh, spread the word, get more people involved. Um, you rock. Thank you so much. Super appreciate that. Uh, it's also given this a one that resonated with you. Myla says, I met him on social media with a new girlfriend. He proposed to me in spite of his girlfriend while also currently going through a divorce. He said he cannot make a decision until we meet each other in person. He's overseas. Interesting. Okay. So I don't know all the context here. I would just sound a slight note of caution that before people are throwing down marriage proposals, I think you need to spend time in person. So I know that might have been really difficult recently, but I think that might just mean, yeah, we're on a slightly delayed timeline. But I think it's really important. You've got to be wary of scams. You've got to be wary of people trying to marry their way into your country. You've just got to, how do you know? I mean, even simply as this, I have friends that I can remember from my time in college and my experience of them in person and on email is completely different, even though I know exactly who they are in person. So if you've only been experiencing someone through you know, email, you know, calls and video is going to be way better. But even then, you've got to get in the room, right? We've got to get in the arena together. So, um, and also when a guy's going through a divorce, let him go through his divorce. And when he's fully on the other side of that, and I don't just mean legally done, I mean, he's also done some grief work and some letting go and some moving on. And maybe he's had his rebound relationship. Maybe he doesn't need to have that with you. Then we can see what we're playing with. Um, a guy who's still going through divorce, I think, can be very tricky to partner with, let alone a guy that you have uh, never met. Amy, straight up, good stuff, Jack. Thank you. Hey, welcome. Thanks for being here. I uh, appreciate that. Um, how do I get that checklist you spoke of? Yeah, so I did put the URL. It might not be coming through um, on every platform. So I'm just going to put it up on the screen here so you can type it in if you want. It's becoming the one dot us or us forward slash checklist. Um, that's how you get that. I love my twin says, thanks, Jack. Awesome information in your kind, authentic voice. Hey, thanks. Um, hi, Jack. Your notion of subjectification has helped me learn more about myself. Awesome. Hey, Mimi. Um, Mimi's been in one of our uh, programs. Um, thanks for being here. And yeah, it's funny. I've been getting this reflection a lot that the subjectification principle, which for those of you that don't know, 
when I'm subjectifying, I'm imagining that people are more alike me than they actually are, that they're motivated in the same ways that I'm motivated, that they do the same actions for the same motivations. And when we relax our subjectification, we actually realize you and I are a bit more different than I've perhaps been giving you credit for. And also drop the should. You know, anytime I'm saying, well, how dare you do that? I would never do that. Or I would never think that. Or I would never say that to someone. That tends to be uh, a little bit of self-righteousness combined with some subjectification, right? So other people don't have to be like you. And it also gets us into our own humility that just because I've done something a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way or even the best way. Um, there are plenty of ways to get up the mountain. Muppet puppet. <laughs> I like that. He's heard me before. I know social distancing means we can't meet anytime soon, but should I just see how things go or ask him what he feels from the connection? Uh, so I am a fan of clarifying conversations. Um, it kind of depends what you're getting from him, right? Sometimes people yeah, can end up sharing a lot of their deeper feelings and feeling a bit hurt because the guy actually isn't into them, right? So I would share your feelings if you're unattached to how it lands or what you need to get back from him. Um, I also think it can be good to really just focus. If there's a guy that's not showing a definitive, clear interest in you, I think it's just good to focus your energy elsewhere because it will be night and day when there's a guy that's clear that he wants to play ball with you. Still then, there are plenty of obstacles to being in relationship. Plenty of obstacles. But if a guy isn't clear that he wants to play ball, uh, that can be really tricky and it's not generally where I want people to spend their time. Um, how much time, says Lisa, do people spend together when in a same city town relationship? Curious what the norm is or what you what you think it should be. Yeah, I think there is huge variance in this. Uh, I often talk about two to three times a week that you're connecting meaningfully, right? So that might be um, we get together in person, uh, we have a scheduled call, um, but real time, it's two to three times a week. You know, if it's if it's fewer than two, it's one or less. For most people, that's not moving in the direction of partnership, unless that works for you, right? But if that worked for you, you possibly wouldn't be answer, ask, asking this question. If two people love just to see each other once on a weekend, that's totally fine. In my experience, though, what that generally is, is lovership, not partnership, right? That we're not actually building a life together. We're not creating mutual obligations. We're not sort of taking life in at least part of our lives kind of together. We probably aren't sharing some kind of living space or shared finances or some kind of sharedness, that's fine if that's what you want. But most people watching right now want partnership. So that's where I would say two to three times plus per week. Uh, thanks for all these questions coming in. Oh, losing my headphones. Let's have a look. I'm scrolling here. Lisa says, in a recent video, you mentioned the opportunity an intimate relationship has when you bump into an issue that appears to be from child or playing out with a partner. How does exactly one identify and fix? So often how that shows up is I'm triggered, right? Let's just say it's on your side of the fence. I'm triggered. So the first stage is acknowledging I'm triggered, right? Even if you can't acknowledge it to your partner, acknowledge it to yourself and to your process or your journal or however you go about things. And then notice that the trigger is a gift in the context of waking you up because we want to get triggered. It's like it's not the thing that we enjoy, right? It might be like fish oil or something that you know is good for you, but you don't actually like taking it, but you know it's good for you and that's why you do it. Getting triggered, no, none of us tends to like that experience, but it's good for us in the sense that it normally is some kind of um, unresolution, as you say, from childhood or from some earlier time in life where I'm not fully in my right to my own autonomy. I'm not fully able to express myself. I'm not able to ask for what I want. Or you have access to something in you that I don't fully have access to in me, right? Maybe you are carefree and I'm kind of uptight, or maybe you're super responsible and I'm kind of carefree and a bit irresponsible, and I therefore judge and resent your responsibility or sense of responsibility. So that that's how you use it, is you use it to say, huh, what do I not, what am I not free to do or how am I not free to love? I think those are the two basic questions. Notice where you have judgments, because often triggers come from judgments. And judgments often come from I don't have a right to this, why should you? Um, or um, the trigger may also be that uh, I'm not getting one of my needs met consistently and I, I have a covert sense that you should meet my needs, right? Ideally, obviously in partnership, we try to meet as many of each other's needs as we can whilst acknowledging that we're human and we'll never do it fully, 
right? We can only just show off as best we can. And the more you take responsibility for, oh, actually, I'm, I'm responsible for my needs. My partner can meet as many of them as they can. I can keep making requests. I can keep inviting them to. But if I'm ultimately responsible, if there's a need that's not getting met, I can meet it in other ways. And I will take responsibility for that. And therefore, I'm less likely to get triggered, you know? Um, when you are in a state of trigger, it can be useful to try and regulate. So uh, long, deliberate, slow out breaths is a good one. Sensing into your body, um, just to, to kind of notice. Because what we want to avoid doing is spinning out, right? Creating a story, um, having a whole conversation with them in, in your head. That's a classic one. I definitely can be guilty of that sometimes. Um, you want to actually slow down, right? And, and let that part of you slow down, because when you slow down, you're, you're less in flight and fight, and you're going to be a bit more reasonable, and your ego might be less in the way. You know, Normally, our ego initially is going to defend us, and that's actually a good thing. It's okay. Look, sometimes we do want to defend ourselves, and at a certain moment, we can relax the defense and just notice. And if there's something that I'm accusing the other person of, this is where Byron Katie, the work, if you've come across this powerful, um, you know, her principle of turn it around, right? So if I have a judgment on you, maybe I can turn that around. Maybe that's actually a judgment I have on myself. Um, maybe the thing I'm accusing you of, I'm actually as a projection. I'm actually guilty of it in some way, or I don't allow myself access to it. So basically, we bring maximum curiosity. Um, that's always a good thing to bring into these situations. Got a lot of ones there. Thank you. I'm glad that regulated. Uh, reg <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that regulated you, darling. I think I meant to say resonated. I'm glad that resonated with you. Oh, my gosh. Zara says, hi, Jack. I missed the first 20 minutes, I have to go. So we'll catch up on the replay, just share this live with my group of friends. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much. I'm appreciating, I've seen a lot of you have liked this. If you haven't liked it yet, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, smash the like, and sharing it, I really appreciate it. That's a great way to introduce new people to this community. It's a great way for me to experience more um, variety in the people we get to work with here. But also, you might just know some people that these themes are relevant. And if they are, let's get it into the right hands. All right, another question here, hi Jack. This is from Nenga. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you truly believe in what is meant to be will be there? Therefore, we just surrender to what it is and let it be. Aren't we supposed to work on what we want? So that's a brilliant question. Um, I think it's both and. I think it's both and. So uh, one thing, when I used to work more with small business owners, right? Before I was coaching in relationships, I actually used to coach people on productivity, and I used to help small business owners that were a bit chaotic get a bit more organized. And one of the concepts I would talk to them about was surrendered entrepreneurship. And surrendered entrepreneurship means I'm an entrepreneur. I make it happen. I go out there. I you know, build the business. I market. I make opportunities. I make connections. I create opportunities for myself. I'm entrepreneurial. But at the same time, I'm surrendered. So I show up. I try as hard as I can. I'm passionate. And then I let go. And what will be will be. Right? Most people fall one side or the other of the fence. Right? Either they go, go, make it happen, but they have a hard time letting go. Or they're kind of chill and they're like, yeah, case or ass or ah, whatever will be, will be. But they don't engage their own agency and they're not actually willing to acknowledge their own desire, right? I don't want to live a life that has zero desire. I just don't want to be attached to it, right? I think that's the Buddhist teaching is to not be attached to your desire. But if you disengage and you never acknowledge you have desire, I don't know, that doesn't feel real or completely human to me. So I think it's both and, right? I ask life, life, hey, I want a partner, life. God, however you think of it, I want a partner. Can I have a partner? And then life gives you something. You say, hey, thank you for giving me that unavailable guy. That's not quite right for me right now. Life, I want a partner. Can I have a partner? Oh, cool. You've now brought me a guy that actually wants a relationship. That's exciting. Let me see what's here, right? So you, you, you remain grateful. You don't always get, you know, this life's delays, God delay, delays are not his or life's denials, right? There's a sense that things can happen on their own timeline. That's the surrender. You and I have to acknowledge that we are not in control of everything. Right? We're not in control of the unconscious processes in our bodies, let alone perhaps our ultimate destinies. Now, there is a way of being in reality that we call life happens by me, where I create my own reality. Right, This is where a lot of personal growth, a lot of entrepreneurs, I back in the day used to work for Tony Robbins, the first job I had when I was 21, promoting Tony Robbins in London. Tony Robbins is a lot about making it happen. Right, Create the life you want, create the reality you want. There's so much power in that. There's also a way of living life where you acknowledge, you know what? I don't only create my reality. There's lots of things that are above my prey grade. There's lots of things that I actually, what I wanted and then what life gives me is actually better. I'm glad that life gave me something different, right? So they're just, we call that life happens through me, right? So I'm, I'm co-creating with life. I show up, I participate, but I also relax and notice what life gives me. And I notice that I'm not in control of everything and I don't need to be and I don't always have to create my own reality, right? Create your own reality could be, 
hey, let's have you experience a particular emotion right now. Right now, experience in your body some happiness, right? Associate, think, flood your system, get grateful, get grateful, get grateful, get grateful, get grateful, get grateful. Feel that in your body. I can create an experience in you emotionally and you could do the same for yourself. But there's also an orientation to life that says, you know what, I want to have my authentic emotional experience. I don't just want to, every time I'm sad, override it and make myself happy or upbeat. I actually want to be in contact with what is already happening. That is the that is the place most of my teaching comes from. Like, how can we be more in touch with what is already happening so that I don't need to disavow my experience? I don't have to defend against it. I don't have to wish it were different. I don't have to pretend like that I'm, I'm having a great experience when inside I'm contracted. I know I'm contracted right now. I'm not committed to staying in it. I'm not committed to making a story. Oh, look at me. I'm so contracted. It happened again. I'm always contracted. Life is so unfair. I'm not a victim, but I am going to fully experience it, right? I'm not going to return to sender. Experience life is me. I acknowledge my own uniqueness and my path, and my path is full of unique experiences for me. So if you want to live from that place, then surrender is the word, really. Surrender is the word, but surrender doesn't mean victimhood. And to someone that hasn't experienced surrendering, it looks like victimhood. So often a false uh, equivalence, right, which gets people stuck. It's like your surrender to me looks like you're being a victim because you're not making it happen. You're not taking control of your life circumstances. Um, taking control of your life circumstances is a great way to be until it isn't, right? And then I think there's a little bit of a graduation that can sometimes happen. Not that you lose your ability to take control of your life circumstances, but it's accumulative. Now I have another perspective. Like if I'm always controlling everything and I'm making it happen and I'm determining everything that happens, maybe I'm kind of missing out or maybe I don't actually trust God in life, right? Because I'm, I'm kind of the big boss around here. And a lot of people take something humbling, right? To realize like, you know, they get a disease that they, ha they can't control or they have something really unfortunate happen. And again, you can frame, you can say, they're my life circumstances. I'm going to choose to experience that positively. But a lot of us grow by actually noticing, you know what? I'm grieving right now. And rather than pretending I need to be something else, let me grieve fully. Let me have each experience fully. When it's sunny outside, I don't need to pretend that it's not. When it's snowing, I don't need to say, let it be sunny, let it be sunny. I can look at it and enjoy it and say, like, that's a season. That's an important thing. It's good that it's raining right now. I like it. You know, maybe I prefer the sun, but I don't have to change it. It's, it's a little bit more accepting. Krishnamurti, you might have come across him as a great sort of spiritual teacher of the 20th century. You know, people said to him, okay, Krishnamurti, what's your secret? And he just said, I don't mind which way it goes. Like that's, that's the non-attachment, right? That's the allowing. That's the, I have the courage to be with what comes up. But it doesn't mean I go to sleep on my desire. I might be very passionate about a particular thing, right? Right now, it's a passionate time in the world, right? There are people that are pushing social change, particularly in the US right now. That's awesome, right? There's sometimes there's a need to just put your foot to the metal and show up and make stuff happen, you know? But you may also surrender around some of the outcomes because there's always going to be unintended outcomes. So it's, it's a little bit both ends. So sort of agency and allowingness. And in an integrated human being, which is a lot of what I'm talking to here, how can we integrate? We want to have access to both of those things. Great question. Well, I'm getting my, getting my vocal cords a good workout here, isn't it? Um, double tipping, sorry. Seriously, though, this is one of the best videos ever. Awesome. Thanks. I'll take that. Um, Duchess of Essex says, I love Byron Katie. The work is so powerful. Awesome. Yep. I know a lot of people in this community like that. And also that journaling helps you when you're feeling triggered. Totally. Um, Yasmin says, awesome information advice. Thank you, Faith. So glad to be listening. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, Jade says, I've been single for four years now and I've started dating again. All the power to you. You know, may that bring you what you want and may it be authentic. Mimi, I, I want... I want to ask him, does a man like staying with their partner who can make him happy, playful, and have a compatibility in sex? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Um, but generally, I would have thought that being happy and playful and feeling compatible in your sexuality, I'm going to imagine that most people are into that. So Cecilia says, how would one deal with someone that refuses to talk about an issue that's important for me to address and be open about, yeah, they don't want to listen despite how important it is for me to express it? Should we not be open to listen to each other and what's important for each of us? So yeah, ideally, in relationship, we are going to be open, and open to listening to one another, right? That's going to be an important thing. Here's the reality is that it's harder to do than most of us acknowledge, right? My, my, myself fully included here, right? As someone who through you know, human development work for the last now 16 years, 
I have been exposed to the idea of listening, deep listening, compassionate listening, all forms of listening and, and the power of them. It's a lot easier for me to do that in a workshop with you as a stranger than it is to do it with my partner or someone that I'm close with, right? Because I've got so many ideas, because there's dynamics, because maybe I've got some needs that I feel need to be met and all sorts of things that can go on. So listening is awesome. It's just difficult. And yeah, of course, ideally, he would be hearing you, right? <clears throat> Here's a little bit of advice for what it's worth. Anytime that you're having the experience of I'm not being heard, I would switch into really trying to hear the other person because most of us have a better time hearing when we feel like we've been heard. So even though it might be great if your partner could make that maneuver, if they're not, maybe you can make that maneuver. And just notice if there's anything that allows you to, to give them a better listening to, perhaps some more curiosity, perhaps some more open questions, perhaps there's an image of them that you need to relax that you don't actually know fully who they are. The other thing that you can do is you can pre-bake some of your issues with a good listener, right? A coach or a therapist so that you've actually gotten a lot of stuff out. You've been accepted. You've been heard. It's much easier sometimes to hear you when what you're talking about doesn't impact me as a coach or as a therapist. And then it's sometimes a little bit cleaner and clearer if you still need to bring something to your partner. And here's the other thing is notice what happens in you when you have the experience I'm not being heard right? Because there might be a, a, a reactivity that gets set off in you that actually has it less likely that you're going to be heard, right? Some of us go into that, I never get heard, or we go into a tantrum, or we go into a strop, or we shut down, or we get critical, or we get strong, or we get blaming, or we subjectify. There's probably some kind of mini strategy that you deploy when you're not feeling heard. And the other thing is, for most guys, it's going to be really hard to hear you if you're being emotionally reactive. Of course, I will support any man to grow that edge of his development that you get to be exactly where you are and that he can still be a strong, conscious, masculine presence. The reality is most of us as men are not there, not only most of the time, but just not most of the time. So anytime that you're being reactive or you're acting out or you are uh, blaming or you are amping up your own emotions, realize that as a guy, most guys have a male differentiated brain, not all, and some women have a male differentiated brain. But the male differentiated brain gets more and more anxious or dysregulated or overwhelmed the more and more emotion comes its way, right? So you might be getting something off your chest, but I'm actually getting more stressed. So that's also just one dynamic that can be in there, just realizing that not every guy is built to be a great listener to you in every emotional experience. Of course, we can train him. Of course, he can grow that, that awareness and that capacity. Um, it might be that you need to learn how to catch him in the right moments, right? I ain't going to give you a good listening if you call me in the middle of my workday and I'm stressed. That just ain't going to happen. Um, and I don't think I'm alone amongst guys in that, right? So most guys do better at listening when they are Two things. One, they're not stressed, preoccupied, that their single focus, if we just think simplistically, a lot of guys have this single focus attention, that their single focus is not, I'm trying to work, but you're talking to me, right? I'm not trying to exonerate bad behavior from guys. I'm just going to say that's going to be much harder. If you have my single focus, you are going to have a much better time um, that I hear you. And number two, I need to be framed. How do you want me to hear you? right? Unconsciously as default, most guys are going to listen with a solutions orientation in their, in their listening, right? I'm going to try and solve your problem. If you just want to be heard, you're going to have to frame me. Most guys don't get that, myself included, right? And I've probably had more practice with this than the vast majority of men just because of the work and the passions that I have in my life. But I might need to be reminded, hey, right now, I just need five minutes. Could you listen to me? And ask it that way. It, don't assume I've got five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 or whatever you need. Ask me. Get my buy-in. Now, if you get my buy-in at a good time and I'm still not listening to you, okay, then we might have a little bit more of an issue. But also realize what you and I codify as listening could be different, right? You might be used to your girlfriends and the way that you listen is very empathetically and you support and you yes and you ooh and you are and you, you jump in and you support and you share your different stories. That's awesome. There's a kind of listening you're going to get from your girlfriends that were probably different than you might ever get from your guy. But there's also a kind of listening that he might be able to give you that's different than your girlfriend's, right? So there's also like different love buckets that you can fill up that might mean that you don't get fixated on, I need this person to hear me. Anytime I'm, I need you to hear me, it can be anger, that can be exactly authentic, and it can be important to express. But it's usually easier for someone to hear you when I'm not in the, I need you to hear me right now, right? Where I'm giving you an invitation, not a demand. Woo, said a lot about that. Thanks for the question. Uh, Myla follow up. I met him on social media. Oh, sorry. This is the one we had before. My bad. Um, 
Can you recommend, says Leanne, how to identify emotional unavailability in oneself and steps to overcome this? That's a great question. And I know that this is a question that's important to a lot of people because I have put out a number of videos about emotionally unavailable men. And I always get a number of comments from women saying, you know what, listening to your video, I realize I've actually just got to own I'm a bit emotionally unavailable. I'm a lot emotionally unavailable. So <clears throat> different types of emotional unavailability, right? Perhaps the primary type that we're encountering is someone that's not actually available to be in a committed relationship, right? So you know, how do you, rec how do you recognize that in yourself? You know, have you been in committed relationship? Have you been able to commit into a relationship? Or do you notice that you tend to have one foot in, one foot out, that you keep your escapes, perhaps you keep some other people in your field, uh, potential other partners, right? So there's always a kind of alternative that you can, you know, be with or fantasize about. So we all have, if we haven't examined it, these sort of unconscious strategies that de-escalate intimacy. So, so that's one thing to really pay attention to. Um, you can take an attachment test, right? And just look at um, what's your dominant style of attachment for any of us that are more on the avoidance side. This is probably going to be a question that we might need to ask ourselves. Am I emotionally unavailable? Um, how do you overcome it? So if you use the attachment example, if you're more on the avoidance side, you learn a bit more about the anxious side, right? And rather than seeing perhaps anxious people as a problem or as something I don't understand, you embrace it. And you notice that there are gifts in the anxious style of attachment, and there are also gifts in the secure style of attachment, right? The gifts in the anxious style is I, I care a lot about the connection, and I'm really sensitive to it. And I notice when you go away, and it hurts me, right? So what would it be like for you when you typically would self-regulate and disappear and do something on your own? What might it like be for you to actually step into the relationship and say, hey, I need your support right now? Or it would be really great if you're available for some connection. Um, <clears throat> the other big part that I see in emotional unavailability comes from having been hurt. I released a video, it's actually when we were in New Zealand, so this is December 2019, and the thumbnail has uh, heartbreak in it. It's a picture of a woman. And in that video, I distinguish being detached from being unattached. Because often what I've seen is that when people get hurt, they become detached. So they're basically like, yeah, I don't really care anymore. Like, you can't really hurt me because my heart's not in it. And I never actually approach another relationship with the vulnerability of I don't actually know where it's going to go or the vulnerability of I'm going to learn how to depend on another human being, right? So if you know you've been hurt in the past and since then you've been shy or you actually just keep attracting emotional unavailability in guys because they're lower risk because they're not actually going to invest, then it might be some time to do some heart work, right? To do some grief work, to really get in touch with those deeper emotions. So if you haven't watched that video, um, December 19, so it'll be a little bit down now, I'd recommend uh, that you go check it out. Hey, Sharon, thanks for joining us. Uh, I was in a program with uh, her last year, so thanks for being here. Appreciate your presence. Thanks for saying hello. Cecilia says, thank you for that. Um, Sharon says, I'm in a relationship. He wants 400. And if I don't do it, he told me he's going to demand 20,000. Don't believe him, so look for a new someone else. What can I do? Uh, if I'm understanding that right, it sounds a little bit like you're being threatened or that you've got some kind of financial extortion or just at least a financial disagreement. Um, I would seek some help. I would get some help from you know either someone professional, a lawyer, or I just get some help from some friends that can talk you through that situation. Um, doesn't sound to me like this person's necessarily your guy. So it might be that your direction of travel is into less contact. Lorna says, I'm young looking, spirited 40 year old and keep attracting men in their early 30s. They're wonderful, but their paths are different due to age difference, but I don't attract men my age. Interesting. So again, another um, video, and by the way, if, if you, uh, here watching, perhaps you're watching on Facebook and you haven't subscribed to my uh, you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I'd recommend you do it because I'm, I'm actually giving you a lot of different videos here and you will hear of new videos if you are subscribed to my channel, which is bit.ly forward slash Jack Butler subscribe, subscribe, I can say that. And I'll actually just flash that up on the screen here for those of you that want to subscribe that haven't. So back to uh, this question from Lorna. So I keep attracting 
men that are younger than me. So I have a video that it talks about age gaps and that might be useful to you if you haven't watched it. The essence of that video is talking about age, sorry, stage, not age, the stage of life, which I think you're actually drawing attention to here. When you say our paths are different, maybe in my language, you're at different stages of life. So that can be really difficult. I don't recommend trying to partner across different stages of life, right? Much easier if we're both you know, wanting to have a family or we're both wanting to settle down or we're both wanting to retire or we're both wanting to travel the world or you know, so on and so forth. Um, now, in some people's, however you think of this, astrology or life path, they are attracted to, and generally have relationships with people who are of different ages, right? Sometimes this pattern goes both ways, right? So either I date and I'm in a relationship with people who are somewhat younger or somewhat older than me. Um, and by the way, I've seen lots of instances of age gaps where the stage is similar that work great, right? And I have plenty of them in my own family, you know, 15 year age gaps that have worked great. Um, so when you're not attracting men of your own age, I'm curious how many dates you're going on with men of your own age, whether you are actually attracted to them or not, right? I would put the attraction aside for a little bit and just get out there. If, you, if you're really keen to be with a guy who's, say, I don't know, in his late 30s or into his 40s, um, start getting on more dates with them, right? And I just want to notice, I'm, I'm curious if there's anything that's, uh, that's going on in you um, or if there's any ways that you're playing more to your youthfulness and maybe you're downplaying your maturity or your spiritual path or inner work or the things that may be important to you. So I don't really have an answer to that other than huge curiosity um, and permission to notice, permission to practice and experiment, permission to date men your own age, whether you're initially interested in them or not, um, because there might be you know, some kind of block there. Or if you want, blow it up even more. Go for men that are older than perhaps your ideal age range, right? What's it like if you date guys in their 50s or late 50s or whatever? See what that's like because um, it, it might just give you some information that you haven't had access to. And the other thing you can do is notice what ponds you're fishing in, right? Perhaps men in their 40s are more prevalent in some other places. Perhaps there's other physical locations, groups that you can join. You know, Perhaps men in their 40s have slightly different interests or group memberships. Like, Is there a way that you can just more naturally meet more of them? And so you up the chances that you're getting someone um, that is going to fit your ages here. All right, so we are coming up to the two hour mark. And I'm also noticing I'm getting a little bit horse here. So I am going to stop this on the hour mark. Um, thank you so much for all your questions and comments. Again, if you haven't liked this video and subscribed to the channel, um, there's a couple of things that I'm going to mention here in case you haven't heard me mention them because they're good opportunities. So the first one is my free guide. It's a checklist. It's called the He's Your Guy Checklist. If you have any curiosity about a particular guy, it's a great resource. It's completely free. Um, I will stick that up on the screen here. It's becomingtheone.us forward slash checklist. And uh, yeah, I just advise you to get it. I've had really good feedback from it. There also, if you're really into it, there's a there's a uh, an actual course, a video course that at the moment I'm offering uh, cheap to people. You'll get an email about that if you download the program, if you download the guide. So that's something that you can keep an eye out for. And then the other thing I want to offer you, if you haven't uh, thought about it, I have a program that is called Becoming the One, Relationship Ready, Becoming the One. And at the moment, as part of uh, lockdown and Corona, we are actually for the first time ever, and we haven't done this in three years, we're offering a 14-day free trial of the program. So this is becoming the one dot us forward slash trial and you can go there um, it's a little page you can just fill the form in put your credit card details in it's free for 14 days if you want to stay with us it's just 97 dollars a month thereafter and uh, it's a really good program and as part of your free trial you get access to the first module you get access to the first bonus interview you also get access to an exclusive live stream that i do only in this Facebook group, so the Relationship Ready Facebook group. The next live stream is happening on Friday, June 19th at 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. So basically, you get a lot of stuff before you even have to decide, is it something you want to commit to or not? So if you haven't done that, I'd recommend you come over, join us in the free trial. This with my teaching partner, Clayton Olson. It's a, it's a really good program. Um, we've had great feedback. There's a, there's a really positive and conscious um, community of women that are part of it, and you can come be part of it as well. So check that out, becoming the one dot us forward slash trial. And just if you are watching this in a particular medium, right? So right now you might be watching this on YouTube, come and join 
me over on Facebook because I'm going to be doing more stuff on Facebook. The community has been growing really nicely there. Um, so that is facebook.com forward slash real Jack Butler. Come and join me over on Facebook because there will be some stuff at times that um, I'm only offering on Facebook and I'm not actually going to be doing on Instagram and uh, sorry, I'm not doing on YouTube and vice versa, right? So if you're watching this on Facebook right now, come and join us on YouTube. That's the link that I've been posting. The other place that you can join me um, where I do post a lot of stories is over on Instagram, which is the same thing, Instagram forward slash real Jack Butler. Um, Sharon says, it's a great checklist, Jack. Love the way you put it all together. and very useful for my regular sanity check. Awesome. Yeah, I'm happy that you found that same. That was really the aim of that was some kind of uh, sobriety and sanity. So come over, join me on Instagram. Um, I'm going to be doing some uh, lives just there. I also post stories there many days of the week that don't appear um, over on YouTube. And the other thing I'm going to be doing is some giveaways. Um, so if you've wanted to get access to one of my guides or one of my paid programs and it hasn't been the right time or you haven't got the money for it, come over and, and get involved in one of the giveaways because it might be your lucky day just to get access to one of these things. So we are 9 o'clock p.m. here, Mountain Time, top of the hour. We've been here for two hours. I super appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for all the comments. Like this, subscribe, join me in these other mediums. Come and do the free trial if you haven't done it. I really recommend it. It will give you great value and there's no commitment to it. And we haven't done it before and we won't necessarily be offering it into the future. So come do that. And if you've been watching this after the event, thanks so much for staying this long. I'm going to love you and leave you. I'm Jack. Thanks so much for being here. Take care, y'all.